So this happened a few years ago when I was 13. I was somewhat popular in school at the time and I had around four very close friends. Rose, Lynn, Noah and Zach. We went on many adventures around that time. Camping, road trips, the beach. Noah's family was pretty wealthy and all of our families were pretty lenient with the rules. One day, the summer before 8th grade... We went on a camping trip with Lynn's older sister, Margaret, and Zach's older brother, Todd. So, there were seven of us. Lynn and Zach and I were 13, and Noah and Rose were 14, and Margaret and Todd, they were both 17. We decided to go camping in a nearby forest around 20 miles from Noah's house. It was pretty much in the middle of nowhere. Noah's house and his neighborhood were the closest homes, and there were no signals for phones or any electronics. We get to the spot easily and without problems and we make camp. The girls were in one tent and the boys in the other and maybe it was a bad idea to have 17s, ages 13 to 17, with no phones in the woods but our parents were lenient, like I said, and confident that we would be fine since the woods were not known for anything bad or dangerous or anything. So we set up the tents and go swimming in a nearby lake and come back and make dinner over a fire which was about 20 feet away from the tents which were four feet away from each other, by the way. We have s'mores and do all those stupid camping things before Lynn and Margaret announce that they're going to bed. That left Todd, Rose, Zach, Nora and I as we joked around and told scary stories and just overall had a really good time. But then, Margaret walks up annoyed and tells us that whatever it is messing with the side of the tent to stop it. Keep in mind that no one had left the group and the tents were far enough away to not bother anyone in the tents. She explains that someone keeps on touching the side of the tent, running something on it, and we just kind of dismiss her. Todd states that it's probably just a tree branch and Rose and I decide to go and sleep as well. So we head back to the tent and Lynn is asleep and we settle in, me closest to the opening. Margaret next to Lynn who is at the opposite side of the tent and Rose is in between Margaret and I. I manage to fall asleep easily, within about five minutes I think, until I woke up suddenly for what seemed like no reason. I checked my phone, I brought a portable charger just to take pictures and it was literally the middle of the night at 2.15. I looked around and my eyes getting used to the darkness try to figure out what I woke up to. There's a, a tapping sound on the tent, and that was the first thing I noticed. And then, a soft giggling. It sounded somewhat deep too, like a male voice, but I couldn't be sure. After what felt like an hour, but it was probably just a minute or two, the tapping and the giggling just stopped. I was convinced that it was my imagination for some time or maybe one of the boys was just trying to prank us or even a tree branch like Todd suggested earlier. Telling myself that it was just a tree branch and a lack of sleep, I fell back asleep until Rose woke me up around dawn. Everyone was awake now and we decided to go and hike a little. We decided to go in two groups because we planned on spending the night again and we didn't want anyone messing with our stuff. Even though these woods weren't popular with camping, we didn't want to take the risk, especially after last night. So Margaret, Lynn, Rose and I, we left to go hiking for a couple of hours while the boys opted to stay behind and fish and swim and cook food and stuff. We hiked for, I think it was about two hours and we came back to the boys, not at the campsite. Annoyed, Margaret went down to the lake with Lynn to find them. Rose and I made our way back to the tents and I'll be honest and say that I screamed and almost wet my pants. The tents, they were completely slashed. I inspected it closer after regaining composure because I was usually the more collected one of the two of us. And it seemed to have been made with a knife of some sort. And the cuts were small, so maybe a small knife? Our tents were made of material that was pretty hard to cut into too, and it seemed like the person had some sort of pocket knife, I guessed. The boys, Margaret and Lynn, came running to our screams and were obviously startled. After that, we decided to pack up and head home early. Because for one, the tents were ripped too much to use again comfortably. And two, Rose and Lynn and I were really creeped out at this point. And even more so, when Todd announced that his tires were slashed. 
we were all freaking out, obviously, because there was no cell service. Todd's tires were slashed and there was no way any of us wanted to stay any longer. Luckily, Todd reported that Margaret's tires looked fine and Margaret stated that she would take Nora and Lynn, drop them off and call 911 and their parents and come back for us. She drove a car and there wasn't enough room for more than three people as the back was filled up with the camping stuff. Zach, Todd, Rose and I, we were left at the campgrounds and we decided to begin a hike back towards the main road so Margaret wouldn't have to drive so far. Also, Rose and I refused to stay anywhere near the camping area anymore because we were just too creeped out. So, we began hiking, my phone died and the last time I looked at it was in the afternoon. Zach and Rose, they both had working phones and constantly updated as to how far we had been walking. As we were walking though, I began to hear branches snapping from behind us, closer to the trees than we walked and... I got more and more paranoid as time went on. I told Todd too and he seemed to get more wary of our surroundings, constantly looking over his shoulder. We had been walking for about 30 minutes now I think. Margaret was probably at Noah's house or almost there by this time when Todd screamed, run. Naturally, I looked behind my shoulder before I began running and three hooded figures were running towards us. The two had knives and they all looked around six foot three or taller. Todd was six foot one and pretty big, but there was just no way that he could defend all of us against three guys. Even though it was broad daylight, I couldn't make out any facial features. They all appeared over or around 200 pounds. The shortest one was probably six foot two, but they all wore hoods and had masks on, like ski masks. We began running and dropped some of our stuff and the three guys just gave up after a while or decided that we weren't worth terrorizing because eventually we lost them. When we made it to the main road where we waited, walking quickly, constantly looking over our shoulders in fear until Margaret finally arrived. We told the police everything and they searched the woods nearby and they just never found any evidence that we had even been there or the guys were there or that anything happened besides pictures of the lake around the area and the shredded tents. I don't know what would have happened if they had caught us. I mean, I'm fairly tall and I was around 5 foot 10 during this time. Only around 125 pounds though and Rose was around 5 foot 1 and 100 pounds and Zach was barely 5'9 at the time. He probably outweighed me though by about 10 pounds maximum. Either way though, I don't think we could have taken those guys on. And so, I'm really thankful that we all got physical activity regularly and were fast enough to just outrun them and that they eventually just gave up. But I will never go back to that spot again. I'm honestly such a grumpy tomboy that I never imagined in a million years that I would end up with a would-be stalker. Especially not with the career I chose. I was a forensic death investigator. A forensic police officers that generally work with the DA's office and or the medical examiner's office that looks into cases of suspicious death like homicides and accidents and stuff. Occasionally, I'd run into people that had a, a passing interest in what I did because they'd seen CSI or Law and Order a few times. No big deal, right? Wrong. So very, very wrong. It all started with the homicide scene that I'd been called to at an ungodly hour in the morning when Mr. Fanboy showed up. He was around his late 30s to early 40s, average height and modestly fit, chatting away with one of the poor unis guarding the scene. It wasn't a big deal. It happens because people are curious, but then he whips out a camera and starts snapping a few pictures. At this point, I figured he really was a, a nosy, tone-deaf journalist and decided to give him a polite lecture on how inappropriate it was to take photos of a crime scene, especially when we're getting ready to move the deceased's body. I deleted the pictures and sent him on his way and figured that I'd never see him again. But no, he pops up again a week later at another questionable scene. It doesn't click yet that something is seriously off until a week after that he shows up at another scene this one being a complete county away from the last one so 
I worked a major city in Texas through the medical examiner's office, so we took cases from several surrounding counties, a few thousand square miles in fact. And it was odd that this guy would just show up to a rather standard scene on the outer edge of our covered area, even if he was the press. I mention it to some co-workers when I get the chance and they've noticed him hanging around some of the scenes too. When he showed up again, me and a uniformed officer shake him down to see who the hell he is and why he's got a major heart on for rubbernecking crime scenes. I'm used to rubberneckers and I get it that people are curious and sometimes a bit morbid when something happened nearby. But once the excitement and the newness wears off, they go on about their business. But Mr. Fanboy... He doesn't have a criminal record, like not even speeding or parking tickets, so my superior had a talk with him. Basically explained that he was making everyone nervous and it looked really shady to just start hanging out at crime scenes. And so he disappears for a couple of weeks, before switching to a new tactic. If he can't hang around the crime scenes, why not hang around the investigators? But of course, only the female ones, right? So Fanboy shows up at one of my favorite drive bars that I frequent because it was near my home, over 30 miles from where I work, mind you. Now, I'm a 5'7 woman who doesn't look imposing at the least, and my co-workers used to tease that I looked like I was a kid playing dress up in my uniform. Like most women, I tried to be polite with the guy who at the time was about 20 years my senior, but declined any offer of a drink. He doesn't take the hints and chats me up with some of the creepiest shit that I've ever heard. But what's the worst crime scene you've investigated? Have you ever worked on a case where the victim was dismembered? Do you think murder and rape cases are really about power dynamics and not sexually motivated? So, obviously, I'm creeped the hell out. I mean, those are things that I don't even want to talk about with a therapist much less a dude who was giving me some seriously rapey murdery vibes. I completely shut him down, and not even trying to be polite, and he seemed a little put off, but not apologetic in the least. I went home and put my service weapon back on and called my supervisor to give them a heads up and start a paper trail for an RO. He served with a cease and desist a few days later, and I figured that the threat of an RO and trouble with the police would deter him from escalating any further. But not even 24 hours after the cease and desist is delivered, he's back to shadowing crime scenes like it's going out of style. At another female investigator scene, he gets into an altercation with one of the uniformed officers in fact. He gets slammed with trespassing, obstruction and a few other charges but since he has no record, he's let out on bail. And shows up to a scene that I'm working on not three days later. We get into a scuffle after he breaks one of my guy's nose to get onto the scene and he's not as strong as he looks but I still ended up with a black eye. He looked worse though by the time my partner and I finally got him in cuffs. An investigation is opened and it turned up a police scanner and a lot of creepy journals in his car as well as notes on where I lived and worked along with info on one of the other female investigators. From what I've heard through the grapevine, his mother's house where he was living, it was also as creepy as hell. Yeah, I never thought people would be that obsessed with crime scenes and forensic or the like that they'd end up going to jail for it. But here we are. I'm also very aware that he probably had a lot of very unsavory things planned for me and or one of my co-workers which still makes my skin crawl to this day. My grandparents were really old fashioned so when I stayed with them as a child I was kept on a tight schedule. Even if I was crying they kept me locked in my room at their attic. But my parents were out on a trip so I was staying with my grandparents and sure enough I started crying and was left there. No one was coming for me which made me cry even more and that's when a young woman in a, a sunflower dress put a hand on me and began to hum. I fell back to sleep quickly and, of course, that memory could be anything since I was around two or three, but I think it's worth mentioning given the following. I had a, an imaginary friend growing up and his name was Lee. 
He was an old man who loved to dance, but was sad because his wife had left him. Late at night, he would come into my room and dance toward music, mostly jazz. He would tell me stories every once in a while about his favorite coffee shop and other weird life stories. My dad thought seven-year-old me was imaginative, but my mother called a priest to bless the house, and after that, I never saw Lee again. Things were quiet for a while, and nothing odd happened. My mum cancelled a few vacations here and there because of dreams she had where one of us died on said trip, and that got annoying, but she had some weird stuff and predicted the future events before, so we just kind of listened to her. My family is also very heavily invested in rodeo, and my dad is a rancher and my mum a barrel racer and so on. I was with my little brother, who would have been five and I about ten at the time, and we were sitting on the top of the bleachers watching my mum compete. My brother and I, we were tickling each other or something, and I pushed him off the bleachers by accident. Which, the fall was not massive, but for a five-year-old falling 70 feet, it was not all that peachy. I was freaking out, and then this woman walks up to me, and she smiles and hands me a Dr. Pepper. She says that I caught him, and he's just sleeping. It freaked me out, but sure enough, my brother was fine, just out cold from the fall and I have no idea where the lady went after that, so I'm not sure what the hell that was all about, but it was strange. Now, there was this mirror in the downstairs bathroom of my house. It gave me bad vibes, so I avoided going down there all the time. But on the days that I did go down there, I would look the other way and just try to get out of there as soon as possible. But one time, I stared into it trying to overcome my fear, but... I was met by um, an older lady staring back at me. I stood there for what felt like hours, unable to move. In fact, my mum found me and shook me out of my trance. It's a weird memory, but it's the main reason I dislike mirrors today. My family also bought a piece of land in the Gila National Forest from a, a practicing witch. On a side note, we actually found a stash of coke, so yeah, that was fun. But... She performed sacrifices and did odd rituals on the property before we moved there. A lot of things happened there too, all starting with my dog digging up animal bones. And then, everyone started hearing voices just passing the dark tree lines at night. We were remodeling the little huts and the shack she built around the property when things really started to pick up. I was left alone in the camper van that we were staying in due to the remodel when something knocked at the door. I opened it to find nothing. I look around and see something dark with red eyes behind one of the trees. It could have been my imagination, but I could have sworn that I heard it say that we come from the mines. Obviously though, I was totally freaked out and I just locked myself in the camper and called my parents. Another side note, the property is now a rental and a weird hermit claimed to see the same thing behind trees with no knowledge of my stories or previous tenants. He moved and apparently a monk refused to step foot on the property due to a bad energy coming off of it. Also, while remodeling, we wanted to donate a bunch of tiles that we salvaged from the floor in the witch's house, shacks, and a Catholic nun refused to accept them due to their energy again. I know this is all really weird stuff, but I'm just telling you all this because, yeah, it, it'll happen to me. But something that the monster said stuck with me. The part about coming from the mines? I actually explored a lot of the back ends of those woods, but nothing will ever compare to when I found the empty field. Imagine for a second wandering through dense woods and stumbling onto something about the size of a, a football field with nothing on it but a boulder dead center into it. This was a town site for an abandoned mine apparently, and on the other side of the field was the Cleveland mine site, abandoned in the 1800s. But this little piece of land is a hidden gem in New Mexico. Old stone towers, staircases leading nowhere, and an old dam holding water. But the weirdest part were the holes though. There were holes and caverns that went on forever, leading into darkness and all I could think of was whatever the monster I saw was it came from here for sure 
I mean, we heard all sorts of odd noises coming from those holes, but I never fully explored them due to the danger of the caves collapsing, and we moved far away from there soon after. Things went quiet again after that until I started going to a private Christian school out of an old Baptist church. The school had a, a massive basement, more like a labyrinth if I'm being honest, and some of my friends and I were messing around down there. And then some really weird stuff started happening after this girl tried to get her best friend to do some ritual of some sort down there. The pre-K 5th graders heard a, a woman singing about morbid things. The Spanish teacher heard every door open and close repeatedly in the early morning, even though she was the only one there. I threw a ball down a long hallway and something threw it back. The pastor came in and blessed the place and the police showed up to look for homeless squatting in the area a few times and it was just really weird. Things have been quiet lately but my mother still sees shadowy figures move around her house apparently at night, but she seems to think that they're friendly or something. Anyway, these are all my stories, and to be honest with you, I really don't understand any of this at all, but I just wanted to share some of my stories with you guys. Back in about the year 2000 or 2001, I was driving by myself from visiting my mum in Colorado back to Arizona. I was in a station wagon and had a desk my mum had given me that was my grandfather's. Now, I've always been scared driving at night that there was someone in my back seat that is going to get me. This might be because of too many scary movies or because my mum's paranoia just rubbed off on me. I was in the army and drove back and forth a lot to visit her and she would get mad at me for sleeping at rest stops or gas stations and tell me that someone was going to kidnap me and kill me or something. But I just didn't want to be bothered with the hassle and expense of a motel most of the time. Anyway, I digress. So, I'm driving on an empty stretch of highway late at night with no other cars around. This red truck comes up behind me flashing his lights and honking his horn at me. I was thinking to myself that there was something wrong with my car or maybe there was something wrong with the desk in the hatchback. Because why else would he be insistent on pulling me over, right? So I pull over and I was in my mid-twenties and still a bit naive at this point and I get out of my car. As I'm getting out of my car, he's directly behind me and still flashing his lights and honking his horn. When I got to about the middle of the car, I planned on going to the back to see what could have been wrong with my car when it hit me. Why is he still honking at me when I'm out of my car? Well, that's really odd. And then he gets out of his truck. And that's when I saw something that just wasn't right. I jumped back in my car and sped off and the next exit was 45 miles or so away. And he followed me the entire time. I take the first exit and go to a crowded grocery store with a laundromat next to it. There was an ambulance parked at the laundromat with its lights flashing and I was next to it. I figured that if there was an ambulance then eventually a police officer should come. But the man stayed in his truck in the grocery store parking lot just watching me the entire time. And honestly, I was really terrified. I did not want to get out of my car and... I felt like an idiot if I would have to tell someone what happened. And I waited about an hour and he finally left. After he left, I waited a little longer before continuing my drive back to Arizona. And I was paranoid and watchful for any red trucks the entire time. So fast forward about five or six years and I'm watching Unsolved Mysteries or some similar type crime show with my hubby at the time. He knew what had happened as we were dating when it happened. And what story pops up? One about a man on that exact stretch of highway with a red truck that used those exact tactics to get a few women to pull over and apparently murdered them. I really am glad that my gut told me that something was wrong and to just get back in my car and drive. Back in 2011, 
I was within a circle of friends that made it a tradition to go camping in a certain spot every May long weekend. The spot we chose was in a beautiful area right on the edge of a large lake and was located on government land. The lake itself had a dam on it too so during May long weekend the water levels were always low if not completely empty making it possible to walk across it. The people were allowed to camp there as long as they weren't causing trouble or making a mess and it was generally a good time for everyone. The spots themselves were paced far enough apart that you had your own privacy but not far enough that you couldn't meet other people. In this particular year our spot was in the middle of a small hill with one camp below us and one above us. The first night of our trip happened without any incident really. During the second day, the people staying at the site below us had moved in. We didn't think much of it and continued drinking throughout the day and into the night. At about around midnight, I'd say, the people at the campsite below us were just really out of control. They were yelling and screaming and their music had gotten even louder, so my friend Ben went down to ask them to turn it down a bit. And he was promptly punched in the face and... He came back to inform us that he was 90% sure that they were all on drugs. After that, the vibe wasn't anywhere near as relaxed anymore and we were all somewhat on edge. I was feeling really tired too, so I decided that I'd just go to bed. Some of my friends were still awake, including Ben and one couple, Lily and Derek, that were visiting another campsite we'd made friends with that day. I could hear that campsite below us still blasting their music and partying pretty hard, but I just tried to ignore it and go to sleep. I don't know what time it was when I was jolted awake. A part of this is just somewhat of a blur for me, but all I know is that I sat straight up as soon as I heard the screaming and yelling coming from outside of my tent. I quickly ran outside to find our campsite it was in total chaos. But one of my friends was clutching their chest and people were running around and screaming to call 911. I was quickly informed of what happened too. Apparently, not long after I'd gone to bed, the people camping at the site below us decided that they weren't finished talking to Ben. And on their way up, they had encountered the Lily and Derek walking back. Now, Derek and Ben are about the same height and have the same color hair, so they thought and assumed that Derek was Ben and bottled both him and Lily over the head with a full glass of bottle. I don't know if it was the same guys that showed up at our campsite, but I was told that everyone else was sitting around the fire when two or three huge guys just appeared from the darkness and walked over to them. One had a paring knife and the other had a butcher's knife in their hand. Ben saw the knives and had gotten up to talk to them and had barely spoken a word when the guy with the paring knife stabbed him once in the chest. At the same time, some people from the campsite above had seen the guys coming and came down to help. One of the guys, Tim, was coming down the hill when the guy with the butcher's knife ran up to him and stabbed him in the stomach. From there, a sheer panic ensued. People called 911, but the ambulance was over half an hour away. And this is where I came out of the tent. Tim's wound was bleeding profusely and he was losing blood way too quickly. His friends ended up putting him in the back of his car and speeding off to meet the ambulance halfway. Ben was also bleeding but his wound wasn't as deep as Tim's and we were able to keep him calm until an ambulance arrived. The guys with the knives ran off into the darkness, back down to the campsite and took off in the Land Rover. My boyfriend at the time and I had gotten into his car and drove to the entrance to try and flag down the policemen on their way to the scene. Once they arrived, we were informed to stay in the car as they had released a canine search unit to hunt down the people who stabbed our friends. By the end of the night, they had arrested the men. They had tried to flee by driving their vehicle across the lake bed where they got stuck in a muddy section of the lake. They were on a concoction of several drugs, as suspected, and luckily, both Tim and Ben survived, although Tim had lost a lot of blood and took a few weeks to recover from his wounds. Derek and Lily had huge goose eggs and possibly one person had a concussion, but I can't really recall that. It was definitely the scariest thing that I've ever experienced and a few of us had to testify against them in court. I've actually provided an online article in the description below if anyone's interested in reading it.
About two years ago, I worked at a movie store inside a mall. I've had tons of strange experiences with customers, but this one definitely tops them off. I was 20 at the time, and this guy was over 6 foot, late 40s, very hefty, and always had this weird zombified expression on his face. He came in about once a week, and one of my co-workers had even warned me about him, how he was just a, a little off, but... I still treated him with as much respect as I did everyone else. One day, he came in and we talked for a bit, but it got a little awkward and I kept trying to end the conversation and look busy by tagging items behind the counter. And he just kind of stood there in silence, watching me for about 20 minutes and finally left. A few days later, he comes back in and walks up to me, holding a large container, he says, I made four pounds of enchiladas at home today, just for you. I remembered you like Mexican food. I don't remember at all telling him that I liked it, but I do know that I went to the Mexican restaurant across the way every lunch break. I just politely accepted it and put it in the back office. I was convinced that he used his jizz in it or something like that, but another few days later, he came back in and had a drawing for me of a dragon. Now, I love dragons, but I never once told him that, and I know that for sure. And this drawing looked like it took hours to make. And at this point, I was beginning to get a little freaked out. I had him leave it on the counter though, so I could just throw it away later like I did the Mexican food. Later on, I was given about a, a week vacation, I think. And during that week, I had cut my hair about 12 inches or so. The day I came back, I got a shift with my manager and I told her all about the guy and immediately she was weirded out for me. And no shit, a few minutes later, I see the dude walking around in the mall. He was going towards the exit and didn't look at me once and my manager tells me to go to the back office. I go and wait until she comes to get me and when she does, she tells me that I need to make a report to the mall security immediately. Apparently, when I ran back there, he turned around to come in and walked all throughout the store. And when she asked him if he needed help with something, he said, I can't believe she cut her hair, and then just briskly walked out. So I eventually go to the mall security office to make a report, and we went through all these videos from the cameras of when the guy came to visit me. But there was one video that really stood out, and... It still sends chills throughout my body just thinking about it. The video shows him pulling into the parking lot of the mall and about three minutes later, I arrive. Now, this was really early in the morning and no customers were here yet, but there were cars in the lot. And I didn't see him at all and it shows me walking towards the entrance and him following me. Right as I open the entrance door though, the man starts sprinting towards me. I walked inside just in time and it shows him stop and just stand in front of the door, watching me through the glass walk a little further away. He begins walking normally inside the mall and I just never noticed him behind me. And that part really messed me up. It was like watching the last footage before a kidnapping or murder on Dateline or something. The video gave the security every reason to ban him from the mall too and they did. But... They later told me that they gave him a background check and apparently he had four counts of having child pornography on his person and was on probation. This happened to me about eight years ago I think. We live next door to my parents in a mobile home and our mobile home was situated further back on the property. Lots of trees and foliage around. I saw a, a man pull up in an old beat up yellow and orange Ford pickup truck. He started walking down to my house and thinking that it was maybe someone to see my dad, I called up to his house. My dad answered the phone but with the call forwarding, it rang into his cell phone and he was in town at the store. 
but by the time the man got to my door, the call had been dropped and I continued talking into the phone like I was in the middle of a conversation since I was the only person now on the property other than my young daughter sleeping in her bedroom. I locked my screen door and asked the man what he wanted. He told me that he was apparently from Enterprise Rental Cars to pick me up and take me somewhere. I told him that I didn't call Enterprise for anything and he insisted that I did. He wanted me to let him in too so that we could discuss this. No way in hell was I opening that door. I just told him no and to please just go away. I shut the other door and locked it too and I grabbed an aluminium baseball bat out of the hall closet and stood there just waiting for him to leave my porch. He stood on my porch for about five minutes before just walking back to his truck. He sat in his truck for about five more minutes before leaving and during this time I had gotten my dad back on the phone and was telling him what was happening. When the guy finally left, he also went down the road the same way he'd come from, which I also found odd because if he actually was looking for an address, he would have gone slower looking around. And while in the driveway, he was parked too far away for me to see a license plate number and I'm pretty sure that a company like Enterprise would not send someone out to a house dressed in all black. Black jeans, black long sleeve shirt, black ball cap, in the middle of summer mind you, and in an ancient beat up vehicle with no identification. Also, he didn't go to my parents' house in the front first, just all the way back to my house. There were no other vehicles sitting in the driveway too and it would seem like no one was home. I truly think that he was there to probably rob us and since I met him at the door, I often wonder what he was contemplating while just standing on my porch for so long and sitting in his vehicle for so long. I'm a, a petite female and mind you, he was a pretty big guy. I'm really grateful that he didn't try anything that day because... If he did, I was screwed. For background, I'm a fairly fit 22-year-old female. I work for a pretty well-known health club in the northwest of England, and I've been on a pretty simple path of self-improvement whilst working part-time and studying at university. Therefore, when my manager asked me if I wanted to do a lifeguard qualification for our poolside, I happily agreed. I mean, it was an all-expense-paid trip, so I never would have said no anyway. They paid for my travel uh, about an hour away from where I was living, but a drive anyway, so they just paid my petrol. With the hotel, the food, and the course, which was uh, pretty cool, I thought. The way the course was set out was pretty normal for a lifeguard course, I assume. It was three days worth of training, four days off, and I returned back home to work, and then I would travel back again for three more days on the third day graduating from the course and becoming an official lifeguard. The first three days, they were amazing and I found my hotel pretty easily and although it was in a dodgy looking area, I did sleep well and the staff were nothing but helpful. In fact, I was hoping to return to the same hotel for my last three days. However, the day before I was due to return to my last three days, my manager told me that the hotel was fully booked. He quickly booked me another one which was in the middle of the town centre and I looked the hotel up and the exterior was dodgy but I thought I may as well give it a chance as it was only for two nights anyway. I went to my first day at lifeguard training as normal when one of the local girls told me that the hotel that I was about to stay at had no on-site parking. She also mentioned that all the surrounding car parks were only for short stays, a maximum of two hours and it would just be best to leave my car at the training center and she would take me to my hotel and pick me up in the morning to go to training and stuff. I thought that this was really helpful and thanked her and took her up on her offer. After finishing for the day, I got into a car and she took me to my hotel. She also mentioned that she used to rent near this hotel which was a small family run business and not a chain. It had no room service and nor any kitchen and therefore pointed me in the right direction to Sainsbury's, a McDonald and Subway, which was perfect. So, night one in the hotel. I walked into the hotel and the lobby seemed nice, although there was some construction in all the surrounding rooms, I must admit. The girl at the front desk 
her blonde hair, blue eyes, greeted me and began to check me in. She smiled and let me know that I'd been upgraded, but she didn't know why. I didn't question it because I was just happy to be in the executive suite. She walked me to my room, which was like a maze. In fact, you needed a special keycard to get to my set of rooms, the executive suites. This meant that no random people could just walk through the hallway near my room, and I felt pretty safe because of that. Upon entering the room, I was really amazed. I have never been in something so classy in my entire life. The room was massive, and on the left, there were stairs to the bathroom. Stairs. There was a balcony, a queen-size bed, a couch, TV with Netflix, and a table full of complimentary water, tea, and biscuits. Well, I chilled for a bit, and then I suddenly realized just how hungry I was and thought that I should nip to Sainsbury's before it got dark outside, and honestly, all was good. On the way back from the shop was when it all started to get really weird. I returned to the hotel and got to the door, which needed the special key to open the doors for the executive suites. And there was a man just stood outside, dressed in a suit. We looked at each other for a moment before I walked past and scanned the door open. I automatically regretted it too, because the man followed me through, very closely too. Now... I'm usually a pretty nervous person at the best of times, and I panic at just about anything. It drives people crazy, and of course, I panicked at this. I thought to myself, better safe than sorry, and literally just ran to my room. Maybe I look like a crazy person, but whatever. However, I turned my head slightly to see that the man had actually kept up to me really well too. I started to cry a little bit and opened my door extremely clumsily, threw myself in and slammed the door closed. But the weirdest bit was that the man actually looked as though he was about to walk into my bedroom. It was just really weird. Now, you're probably thinking, why didn't you call the front desk? And truth is, I don't know why. Maybe I should have, but with how the story progresses... I know I did the right thing by not calling the front desk. I'll explain, don't worry. So I eventually calmed myself down and thought about running myself a bath before Love Island started at 9pm. I ran the bath and stripped naked and sat on the toilet. I left the bathroom door wide open because, I mean, I was in a nice hotel room and why not, right? I had a very clear view of the front door and as I stand up to flush... I hear a noise, like the sound of the front door opening. I look up to see that it has opened. I ran to the bathroom door and slam it shut and lock it and I just sank to the floor and began sobbing. I turned the bath off so I could listen closely to the room outside the door but didn't hear anything. I messaged my best friend who lives in Crete, so even if something did happen, she wouldn't have been able to do anything about it. In fact, I don't even know why I did this. I just thought that there was no way that this was actually happening, and if I called the police, I would just be laughed at. But I sat there on the floor for half an hour till my friend convinced me that it was all just in my head and to check. I let her know my hotel name and room number, just in case, and told her that if I didn't reply in five minutes, no matter what, to call the police for me. So she agreed and I left the bathroom. When I got out there, all looked really normal. I checked under the bed, the balcony, the wardrobe and everything was fine. No masked murderers, although I tried the lock to the front door with the manual lock that are normally on hotel room doors but found that there just wasn't one and this freaked me out a bit but I just kind of laughed at myself, grabbed one of the two bottles of free water and downed it during Love Island and just fell asleep soundly. When I woke up the next day, I got ready quickly because I overslept and grabbed the last bottle of water off the desk and ran to meet the girl who was picking me up for training. And I just forgot all about the night events. But the last night at the hotel, now here's where shit gets weird. 
I come back relatively early to revise for the assessment the next day and it was about 30 degrees outside and inside mind you because the room was unair conditioned. So I stripped down to my underwear and I noticed that the non-complementary waters had been restocked so I assumed it was maybe just the one off considering I didn't pay full price for the room or anything. I revised for maybe 30 minutes, but the heat made me kind of sleepy. And I don't even remember falling asleep, but I do remember the sound of the door next to me slam shut. The front door. I felt groggy and didn't open my eyes straight away, but when I did, it took my eyes a few seconds to adjust. I brushed it off quickly until I sat upright and my eyes focused on the table, which was now full of complimentary water and it definitely was not there before. And next to me in a bed there was a random sock, a black ankle sock that was definitely not mine. One of my socks that I had put into a pair was no longer on the floor too but had gone missing altogether. Like someone had taken off their own sock and put on mine or something. My mind automatically thought that it just had to be the staff and therefore I didn't complain to management. I mean, this was not a chain hotel where a creepy employee just couldn't be held accountable, but a family run business. But what if I complained to the creep that had been doing this? So I barricaded myself in the room and just barely slept that night. Upon checkout, an elderly man was at the desk who I'd only ever seen in passing. He asked if I liked my room and I tried to be polite and just told him yes, but despite the weird events which I began to question myself about again. He told me that the manager had rang the day before I arrived and he decided to give me a quiet room to myself which he likes to do for the younger girls. He then asked me to leave them a good review. I began to feel a, a little bit uneasy again for some reason but I had my lifeguard assessment that day and pushed it to the back of my mind. I passed with flying colors and drove home and it wasn't until I sat in my own bed that the situation, it really hit me. Something just wasn't sitting right with me. So I went into the hotel's trip advisor and it's something I should have done in the first place I know. Or well, my manager should have done it at least when sending a young girl alone somewhere. And there were three separate reviews. Out of the four reviews that I bothered to read, feeling too sick to continue, three contained a warning to women. Apparently, men were trying to get into their rooms, and staff would just walk in unannounced. And even when they were confronted, the staff would deny it. This is when I knew that I had not made up what had happened in my head. The people or a person had been coming into my room whilst I slept and whilst I was half naked and stayed for an unknown period of time stealing my clothing. I let my managers know who made an official complaint against the company but so far nothing has come back and I don't know what else to do about the situation. I'm going to provide some screenshots of the reviews if you guys are interested to read them because some of them are pretty creepy to say the least. So back in 2015, I had the choice of getting a dog and getting a smartphone. I'd never had a dog in my life or a decent phone come to think of it. And I'd been saving up for a phone anyhow, so naturally, I picked the dog. My dad knew a fellow who had a couple of border collies that had recently had a litter. So we drove out and the dude gave us the last pup. And so, and to Bailey... And a couple of weeks after, he got his shots and I started walking him. Well, my parents figured that I was going to be hanging out at the local park with my new pup so I could get him socialized, but no. I chose to take him around the perimeter of a nearby farm to keep the farm dog in him. I'd been sneaking out to this farm for years. The farmer was actually an old family friend. My uncles had grown up working for him, so I knew if I was ever caught that I could just drop their name. On the other side of the farm, there was some thick woodland which no one had ever given me any reason to be wary of. But thinking back on it, they probably should have. 
so it's a sunny afternoon and it had been pouring down all week and Bailey was itching for a good walk. I take him to the farm at our usual time and we start making our way around the woods on the east side of the farm. Everything is quiet but Bailey keeps darting away from me to explore. He's a puppy and it's what they do but of course I've been calling his name all the way around the field. We're about halfway past the woods and I could see the roof of the farmhouse over the next hill. Bailey's been pulling the crap out of the bushes all the way along and I just got him into trouble for rolling into a pile of fox crap. And that's when I hear a man's voice calling my dog by his name. Like this dude that I didn't even know was calling my dog by name. I knew it wasn't the farmer too because I'd met him at a family event like a barbecue and wedding and stuff like that. So I knew what this guy's voice sounded like. I go completely silent but the guy keeps calling on my dog. It sounds like he's deep into the woods and maybe moving. He's calling my dog with an excited tone in his voice too, which is kind of what creeps me out the most. Bailey, meanwhile, is completely ignoring this guy and sniffing the now flat pile of poop. Now, I'm like a tiny 18-year-old girl, and the most combat experience that I've ever had was a month learning Taekwondo when I was 11 and I don't have a mobile phone or anything. In other words, if that guy is sinister and finds out where I am, I'm pretty much fucked. Or if Bailey decides to go in after him, then I'm double fucked because I'm not letting a possible psycho get his hands on my puppy. I can either run to the farm, which isn't too far away, or run back through the field towards home. I pick up my dog and sprint across the field, and behind me I hear someone emerge from the woods but I'm already over the fence and sprinting back home with my puppy tucked under my arm and I get home and tell my mum and she just brushes it off as some weird drunk guy. A few weeks later I'm at my uncle's house and the farmer walks in. I told my uncle what had happened so he brings it up and the farmer asks exactly which woods that I'd been close to and that some of his clothes had gone missing from his washing line recently. He'd put it down to strong winds, but now he wasn't so sure. I take him and my uncle to the exact spot the next day, and all three of us go in, and I find a completely wrecked campsite. There's no clothes or anything, but the tent has collapsed in on itself. There's no fire, but there are some empty gas canisters like you'd use for a portable stove, and empty packets of food scattered everywhere. We eventually report it to the police, but nothing ever really comes from it. Except that I got a phone not long after this, and now I keep it on me wherever I go. I had my first real boyfriend when I was in high school, and we stayed together all the way till uni, and when we both started working a few months into both of our first jobs we started drifting apart and getting into plenty of arguments but we still did not call it quits probably because neither of us really had the heart to as i started to get to know my colleagues i found myself spending more time with them and less with my boyfriend part of my group of colleagues was an older guy i was 20 at the time and he was 37 and he was pretty good looking but serious and quiet probably just because he had just joined the company as well. One day, he starts messaging me for work-related stuff, and when we started talking about other stuff, pretty soon we were chatting quite frequently. But to be fair, I would say that there was mild flirting going on, but it was mostly just getting to know each other. My relationship with my boyfriend didn't improve too, and one morning before work, he decides to break it off. I was super distraught at work, panicking and realizing that I wasn't ready to end the relationship yet. My colleagues decided to take me out after work for drinks to calm me down and I did drink quite a lot. I'm not really a drinker though so getting drunk is pretty easy, albeit rare for me. I couldn't really drive in that sort of condition so the older guy volunteered to drive me home. Everyone else starts to leave and soon it's just the two of us in the bar. 
I tell him that I want to leave already because it was getting late and I actually wanted to go home and talk to my boyfriend about getting back together but he convinces me to drink a couple more which I stupidly do. The rest of the night remains a, a bit of a haze as I really don't remember what happened after that but all I know is that I woke up the next morning in an unknown hotel, naked, next to the older guy. He wakes up with a smile and begins to dreamily tell me about how he made love passionately and so on. Honestly, I'm filled with horror because I just couldn't remember a lot of things from the night before. All I can remember was crying the whole night and I do recall telling him repeatedly that I really wanted to go home but till today it's all just a a frustrating blur. I start crying and he panics and drives me back to my parents house. Before I get down from the car he leans over to kiss me on the lips but I avoid him and just rush out. A few minutes later I receive a text from him telling me how much fun we had and how much he was in love with me. I was really creeped out and told him that I wasn't ready for another relationship but we could stay friends if he liked. I was really young and naive, I know. After that, he would text me multiple times a day, even at work, telling me how much he loved me. I tried my best to avoid him, but I didn't tell anyone about what happened, so I couldn't stop him from coming along to our colleague outings or anything. I began to dread those as well, because he would always try to sit next to me during meals or meetings, and would quietly slip his hand under the table to stroke my thighs and crotch. In fact, once, when it was just the two of us in the office elevator after work, he suddenly pushed me back and started kissing me and it only stopped when I pushed him away, making excuses that I was worried that we might get caught by others. Looking back, I don't know why I didn't just leave or tell somebody, but I was really young and it was my first job and I really didn't want people knowing that I slept with this stranger at work. I was just so stupidly conscious of being labelled a slut and this whole thing goes on for a few more months because of this and I never did anything while he continued. I eventually reconciled with my boyfriend and we soon moved back in together and I never told him about the older guy. When older guy found out that I was back with my boyfriend, that's when the shit started to get crazy. He found out where we lived and I would catch his car across the street many nights and he would stay in his car all the way till morning. On weekends when we would go out for meals, I would suddenly see his car parked where we were eating or he would suddenly be seated behind us in the same cinema. He even followed us to church once and that still gives me the chills because I had not expected that one at all. He seemed to just appear in the most random places. So to me it just felt as though I couldn't escape him both at work and outside of work. I was always constantly looking over my shoulder but just never confronted him because I didn't want my boyfriend to find out. Older guy kept telling me about how passionate I was during our night together that I soon became scared that I really had acted that way and didn't want my boyfriend to find out and leave me. Although I'm pretty sure that I was too drunk to be anywhere near as passionate as he described. His messages and phone calls became more frequent too and I was so scared of the whole thing coming out in the open so I would reply to his texts and calls which mainly consisted of him breaking down on the phone demanding that I leave my boyfriend and all his undying love declarations and stuff. I then found out uh, a few weeks later that I was pregnant with my boyfriend's child. We were of course happy and decided to have a small wedding in fact. When older guy found out he became convinced that the child was his. Mind you, the timeline made that impossible. So he started cornering me at work, telling me that he loves me and his child, about how much he loves our child and that he would marry me, that he was already planning to get a new home for us and that he already had the perfect name for our child, etc. The final straw was when he suddenly showed up at my front door with a ring and hysterical about wanting to marry me. But thankfully, my boyfriend wasn't home at that time. I was honestly just really scared, but I managed to put him off telling him that I would really think about it, and he demanded a kiss for which I gave him just so that he would go away. 
that incident really freaked me out so I finally just decided to tell another male colleague about this and he went to talk to the older guy and try to get him or threaten him to stop his bullshit. I just couldn't take the pressure of dealing with the older guy anymore so I also decided to quit my job. He didn't stop messaging me though and showing up at random places and my home too but thankfully we moved to a new place after our wedding. Thankfully he didn't crash the wedding reception as it was held in another state. I took the opportunity to change my phone number as well but he resorted to emailing me poetry and long emails about still wanting to be together but I was so far removed from him that I could just ignore him now. Thankfully he seemed to give up after that too. My male colleague informed me that the older guy decided to migrate to another country due to being so heartbroken. Not like I cared or anything, mind you. And life went on after that. I had my child whom I loved to death and a fulfilling marriage with my boyfriend, now husband. That was until I attended my former colleague's wedding and there he was. I felt my heart drop to the floor but tried not to show it because I had my husband and child with me. We were seated on the same table the whole night too and I just caught him staring at me many times throughout the night. The worst was when I left to go to the bathroom and then returned to see him cradling my baby in his arms. He had asked my husband if he could hold the baby and kept snuggling against my child. I quickly took my child away from him and told my husband that I wanted to leave early as I wasn't feeling well. My husband did ask who the older guy was but I brushed him off by telling him that it was some old colleague that I never really spoke to at work. Nothing happened after that until I suddenly received a text message a few days later from a random number asking how I was going. I asked who it was and I got a reply telling me that it was him. I ignored the message and the next day I just changed my number again. I still receive random emails and texts from him over the years and I've changed my number so frequently. My husband, friends, family have questioned me about that too but I usually make up some excuse. But thankfully besides that nothing else has happened. It's been a few years now since the very last message and I do get nightmares every once in a while of him suddenly appearing again and I do get paranoid about him showing up sometimes and find myself checking the surrounding cars on him out and whatnot. But the most recent thing that I heard about him was when my male colleague messaged me a few months ago to let me know that he'd been messaging the guy to ask his opinion if there was still a chance of us getting back together again. So I wish I could somehow erase that nightmarish year out of my life but What's done is done and I just wish this older guy would just leave me and my family alone. So to tell this story we need to jump back about three and a half years ago. I was a senior in college and living with my boyfriend and one of my best friends and another really good friend and his girlfriend in a fairly large house that we were renting near campus. Since we had an entire house and not just a small apartment, a lot of parties ended up happening at our place. Living in a college town, it was natural to have people at a college party that you may not even know personally, but they were maybe a friend of a friend or something. So, if ever I saw someone that I didn't recognize or know at our house during one of the parties, I never gave it too much thought. On one particular night, I was pretty tired, so I went up to my room and ditched the party and got into my bed to watch friends by myself. My room was pretty big and on one side was the entrance to walk past the other bedrooms, go down the stairs and into the living room. On the other side of the room was a door that led to the garage. If you open the door... There's a sketchy sort of uh, a floor panel. I'm really not sure what else to call it, but it's not by any means something strong enough where you should jump on it or anything. And I'd be careful having too many people stand on it for fear that the wood would break and everyone could fall quite a distance. Maybe about eight feet or so. There was a ladder that led up to this platform, so if for some reason you were ever near the garage and needed to come into my room without going all the way around you could come up this ladder and through the door. 
At the bottom of the ladder was another door that was one of the entrances to the kitchen. Anyways, I was hanging out and watching friends when this guy came up to my bedroom door. He was clearly drunk, college aged, skinny, brown hair and wearing really billowy orange MC Hammer pants. And even though he had that, uh, that creepy drunken emptiness look in his eyes, I didn't think much of him coming up here. So I asked him what's up and he told me that he was just exploring the house and was curious as to where the other door in my room led. He said he loved learning about how rooms connect to one another and the basic ins and outs of the houses that he goes to. I know, it's a real weird explanation and I probably should have seen it as a red flag but didn't. I said something along the lines of, oh, that door goes to the garage which is entered in through the kitchen, but I'm going to bed so good night. And he went back downstairs. Again, I didn't know who this guy was and nor had I seen him before, but he didn't really look threatening or anything, so I let it slip. And at the time, I had a house full of people downstairs, so I felt safe anyway. And so eventually, I just fell asleep. But it must have not been too long before I felt someone in my bed stroking my stomach. I figured it was my boyfriend and tried to fall back to sleep. But the stroking continued and something in my mind just said that this doesn't feel like my boyfriend's touch. Not only did it not feel like him, but it was like I was being stroked slightly with a single fingernail or something. And my boyfriend didn't have long fingernails either as he trimmed them on a regular basis for hygienic purposes but also for his job. So I did what my instincts told me to do which was to run my hands through the person's hair. And it was at that point that my heart sank. My boyfriend had really long hair and always wore it in a ponytail or bun. This person in my bed however had very short hair. My next thought was, what the hell, Cole? Cole is one of my friends that I was living with at the time, and he has short hair, and I wouldn't put it past him to get drunk enough to climb in bed and try to cuddle or something. I got up quickly but calmly, peeling him off me, and they're trying to pull me back, but not saying a word in doing so. No words were being said at all, and this was all happening in the pitch black of my room, mind you. I finally made it up and headed downstairs to tell Cole's girlfriend that, for some reason, her boyfriend is in my bed and to please try and get him out. As I walked downstairs, however, again, I felt my heart drop into my stomach as I saw Cole sitting on the couch with his girlfriend laughing. Thinking that he somehow played a trick on me, being in a half-sleep daze and thus not connecting the dots, I asked if he was just in my bed to which he looked genuinely confused, obviously. We both looked towards the staircase and at that moment, who comes strolling down but the guy with the orange MC hammer pants? I immediately told my boyfriend and fled back up to my room and various friends and my boyfriend were trailing behind trying to get more information. As I get to my room and flick on the light, I see that the door going to the garage is open meaning I had literally told him how to get into my room without anyone noticing. I frantically told my boyfriend and our good friend Austin what had happened. Austin ran downstairs after this guy who was just on his way out of the door and what they told me after coming back upstairs has haunted me ever since. The guy turned around to face Austin and Austin could see that the guy had his hand fumbling around in his giant pants pockets. After a few angry back and forths and some questioning, Austin got him to the ground only to find that this guy had a knife in his pocket. And no, not a pocket knife, but a giant kitchen knife from our kitchen. In other words, when I felt a single sharp fingernail grazing my stomach, it was not a single sharp fingernail, it was a knife. Austin proceeded to punch the guy in the face before coming upstairs to tell me what had happened and for the rest of the night after that and many nights after that I proceeded to feel scared out of my mind that he was going to come back through the garage. The following day I made my boyfriend put a deadbolt on that door. 
I still get scared to sleep alone at night and make sure to have all entrances and exits on lockdown. Especially because I've actually seen that guy walking down the street or at the bar multiple times after this incident. And to be honest, I don't think he even recognizes who I am anymore. I'm just a, a nameless, almost victim. But what makes me sick to my stomach, even more so, is that I found out a few months later that I was about a month pregnant at the time this all happened. It really does terrify me to this day to think of what could have happened if I just hadn't have gotten up and ran downstairs. Oh, and by the way, when I asked who the hell invited this guy over, no one knew who he was and he was just some sort of total stranger. But... Even weirder, he came with a friend that night, who no one knew either. And the next day as I was cleaning up in the kitchen, and guess who waltzes into our house but this guy's friend. I asked, hello, can I help you? And he said that I forgot something here last night. Walks into our pantry and comes out with a paper bag and just walks out the front door. To this day, I have no idea what was inside that bag. I moved to Spain when I was about six years old, and I used to live in Algeria. Algeria is a country in North Africa. It's part of the Maghreb and the white northern part of Africa. My mom is Spanish and my dad is Algerian, and I was actually born in Algeria, and so were my siblings. In Algeria, they believe in demons and ghosts, and I'm pretty sure most people there have experienced something paranormal in that country. It's well known if you're from that place where the black magic is commonly practiced. Summoning demons for malicious services, like a couple breakup or hurting someone. There's also allegedly a lot of paranormal things happening in these places. Personally, I believe in demons and I have a bunch of stories that I'd like to share with you. Ones that I experienced and ones that members of my family experienced. But uh, let's start with one of mine. So we have this villa in Algeria. On the top of our villa was an apartment that belonged to my uncle and he planned on renting it but never did until much later. And on top of that apartment and on top of the hill was my uncle's villa. Both are beautiful places facing the sea. Each had two big nice gardens too and literally they were dream houses. Especially for a kid like me who loves to bike and run around and yet... I hated it too because I was scared of this house. The main rooms that I was scared of were the bathroom, my brother's bedroom and my sister and I's bedroom. Whenever I was in these rooms, I can't explain why but I just felt uncomfortable. Like something threatening was around and I wasn't safe. My sister and I never talked about it at the time and I was 5 and she was 12 or 13 I think. I didn't even know what demons were and I knew about ghosts but only the nice Casper type if you catch my drift. Despite never talking about it too, I knew that she was scared. She would always ask me to come with her to the bathroom or come with her to our bedroom to keep her company. At night, we both hid our faces under our sheets when going to sleep too. One day, I was left alone in the house. My brother was at uni and my sister was still at school and I came back from school on my own as usual but both my parents weren't home. I stayed in our main garden for a while and I just refused to go inside on my own but there was no shade in the garden and it was 4pm and it was really really hot. The city I lived in was very very humid too which made the heat even more unbearable. There was shade in the second garden but it was only accessible through a door and it was locked. So I had no choice but to go inside. I did and it felt much better because it was way cooler in there. This house was always cool or cold and it was a blessing in the summer. So I went to my room and started playing with my toys and there's a short corridor leading to my bedroom and it took a whole lot of courage for me to go through it and there are several closets in that corridor including one that never closed properly and that always scared me. Always felt like something was just going to jump out of it but it was just a little bit of fear though. It wasn't as real as what I felt in like the room I disliked. Once I was in my bedroom 
I started playing and took a couple of minutes to get all my toys out and set them up the way I wanted to. I used to love playing pretend with my toys and make them speak and give them different voices, but at that moment, I couldn't speak at all for some reason. I just felt really scared and I really strongly felt like something was behind me, just watching me. I felt dread and I had a funny feeling on the back of my neck and I'd never experienced that before. And yes, you can say that maybe it was just my childish imagination, but can imagination really trigger such a, a primal fear? I don't know, but I felt like I had to just run away from that room ASAP or something bad was going to happen to me for sure. I got up and I calmly walked out of my room and walked through the corridor. But just before I reached the end of the corridor, I heard a loud bang behind me that made me jump. From then, everything happened so fast that it's hard to remember, but I turned around and I saw the window just wide open. There are trees behind my window and I swear, I did not see any of their leaves move, not one bit and I didn't feel any wind coming in. I started racing to the living room and the only place where I felt safe, I slammed the door behind me, turned the TV on loudly and acted like I wasn't scared anymore but my heart was racing like crazy. Anyway, after a few minutes of calming myself down, I opened the window to the living room and the air was the same hot, humid, and windless. But what was really strange were the window shutters. They were slamming against the wall over and over for what felt like forever. It was possible for the window shutters to slam against the wall because when you open the window, the shutters are inside and not outside too. Even if assuming it was windy and I'm really positive that it wasn't at this stage, the shutters would be out of the wind's way, stuck against the wall. It's a little tricky to describe all this, but I hope you guys get it. I only left the living room when my parents came and I just didn't tell them anything. I just wanted to forget about it and I wasn't sure if they were going to believe me anyway. But when I was brave enough to go back to my room, the window was still open and I noticed cracks on the wall when I closed it. I told my mum that I found the window open when I came home and the cracks were already there. I wasn't the type of kid to cause trouble, so she believed me with this one. I was still shaken and terrified of what had happened, and it was just one more reason to hate this house even more. After that, a few more incidences happened too. One day, my dad woke up with scratches on his arms. Long, thin scratches, like a cat's scratch, but long, and we only had a turtle and a dog that spent most of their time at my uncle's house anyway, and they were not even allowed inside our house too. But one day, just out of nowhere, there was this horrible smell in the laundry room too, and filthy water. And to this day, I'm not even sure if it was water. And it just came out of nowhere. The washing machine was functioning well, and there was no leak anywhere in the walls or in the ceiling, and we were just completely baffled. But one evening... And this one really solidified for me that there was something wrong. I was playing hide and seek with my cousin and it was my turn to find him. And as I was looking around, I saw a shadow running to my bedroom. I immediately thought that it was him and followed. I saw the legs from the corner of my eyes hiding under the bed and at this point, I was convinced that it was him. I went on all fours and since it was evening and it was getting dark, I couldn't see that well but... I definitely saw the figure of a little boy just laying on his stomach under my bed. All I remember was his dark brown eyes, just like my cousin's, and his blank expression. I yelled, I found you, and just as I got up, I felt a sharp pain in my forehead, and then I felt blood falling down my nose. I started crying and the next thing I know, my sister and my mum and my cousin rushed inside my bedroom to help me. At that moment, I was in so much pain that I was really dazed and kind of confused as to how he managed to run inside the room along with my sister and my mum when he was hiding under my bed 10 seconds ago. And the only explanation that I can think of now is that it wasn't my cousin under the bed, which leaves me questioning to this day. Who was that?
The cut that I received was a, a little cut on my forehead, but it was deep enough that it needed stitching. But when my dad investigated, he said it was a twisted nail that somehow went through the bed and scratched my forehead. I was asked what I was looking for under that bed, and I said that my cousin was under it. And my cousin said that he was hiding behind my sister in the living room all along, and my sister also confirmed it. A year later, we moved to Spain, and all this dread and fear that I had whenever I was left alone in the room was finally gone. My sister and my brother decided to stay in Algeria to finish their studies. My sister experienced sinister things in the house too, and after she and my brother joined us in Spain, the house has just remained uninhabited for four years until we came back one summer when I was a teenager. I was not happy to be back, mind you, and there was no way that I was sleeping in my bedroom again. On the first night, I slept in the living room, and it must have been 2 or 3 a.m. when I started itching. I was half asleep and it was just getting worse and worse and it got so bad that I got up and turned the lights on to check what was wrong. And covering my naked legs and my shirt were fucking ants. The couch was absolutely covered in ants. And while spraying it with some sort of product, I remember how my mum, who's superstitious, always said that ants represent leaving or moving out and that that couldn't be a coincidence. The next day, I went to my aunt's and stayed with her until the end of our stay, and after that one summer holiday, I just never went back to that house. So this was back around the time that I graduated, or sometime shortly after 95. My family, they lived in Michigan at the time, fairly close to the Indiana border. Some friends that I'd play D&D with got into this ghost hunting stuff and whatnot, and we'd often travel down to the Indiana side, which was around 45 minutes away, I think. On this particular night, though, we had to pick up the girl that I was dating. Her and I were sitting in the back seat while my two buddies were in the front seat. We're on a somewhat uh, a secluded two-lane road with thick woods on the right side of us. And that's all I can really remember. I'm not trying to be vague at this point. I just really don't remember much about the area or exactly where we were. And John says something to the effect of, Don't trust what you see around here. I hear your eyes play tricks on you in this area. And almost as if on cue, we start seeing what basically looks like black fog or shadows darting and swimming across the road in the light of the headlights. We remain calm and just keep going though, and eventually the road tees off to the right and into the woods and we take the turn. After about a quarter mile, the road either goes straight or onto a gravel or tees to the left. We take the left and at this point we're driving slow, maybe five miles an hour and both the girlfriend and I are looking out the passenger side window. I was on the passenger side if that matters and about 15 feet into the woods, maybe 30 from us total. I see what looks like a, a small naked old man hunched over just eating something bloody and messy and its back was to us. My mind immediately went to folklore and I think red cap as soon as I see it even though it wasn't wearing anything. I slowly turned to the girlfriend because it's a bit much to see and not think you're batshit crazy and her eyes are taking up her whole face and She's already teared up and they start streaming down her face when she looks at me because she's totally petrified. We both tell my friends in front that we need to get out of here, that there's something in the woods and she's basically crying and I'm pretty well freaked out by this point too. The two in front didn't see it and they're frantic to know what we saw and want to drive by it again, which the two of us want nothing to do with. But... A hundred-ish yards later, the road turns to the right onto the gravel, and the driver decides that we're going to turn around here and go back the way we came. We get turned around, and as we start off the gravel, the car dies. It was not a clutch issue, and it was an auto, and it was just a, a pretty unexplainable engine quit. The girlfriend flat-out starts screaming, 
and the driver says to relax and tries to turn the engine over and thankfully it starts. However, the moment the car turns over, the headlights immediately turn on behind us. Mind you, it's pitch black out and there are no street lights. It's a heavily wooded area too and we hadn't seen another car in who knows how long. But then, as if out of nowhere, the headlights were just facing where this car appeared where we were trying to turn around. At this point, everyone fairly well decided, okay, fuck this, we're obviously somewhere where we shouldn't be, we're just out. So we end up just driving back by the area we saw them in and there was nothing there now. No little naked man, no deer and I believe it was a deer that he was eating when I first saw it. And we get to the area where it first branched off to the gravel road when we first went into the area. As we approach this road, and the other car is following behind us, mind you, we're eager to get the fuck out of there, another set of headlights turns on from the gravel road as well. So, in the car, there's the four of us all going, holy shit, just believing we stumbled into some sort of weird occult shit and we didn't mean to, and all we want to do is just go back home now. We drive back to the main two-lane road that took us this way and both cars just go their separate ways, uneventfully. It's been over 20 years and honestly, I still get chills thinking about all this. The little naked gnarly man all bunched over eating the deer is just as vivid as it was ever. A lot of weird shit happened when I lived in that area too. This, of course, was the most extreme but... I had about 20 years of just unexplained experiences crammed into the two years that I lived there. To describe the red cap further from what I remember is that it was naked. I believe it would have been maybe three and a half feet tall if it stood upright and really stocky. It was squatting down low, ass almost touching the ground while it ate and also somewhat hairy. As in hairy like that one hairy friend we all have on its shoulder and back. There was definitely blood all over its hands and forearms and it was holding what looked like the leg of a deer I think. There was just a mess of the rest of whatever it was eating at its feet though. I had about a, a three quarter view of it, but mostly its back I think and I didn't really get a good view of its face. But it was a little off like as it kind of glanced over its shoulder at us nonchalantly as we drove by. I just remember it kind of looked old and menacing like a, a furious little 70 year old man and it was unnerving to say the least. I've had a couple of paranormal experiences in my life but none that made me feel too uneasy but this one was the one that actually made me leave my house for a week. It's definitely my fault for using the Ouija board. I do not recommend, by the way, unless you know how to use it properly. And I will never try it again. This happened about seven years ago, I think, when I still lived at home with my parents. This is a long one, and I want to make sure that I get in as, as much detail as I can. Anyway, when we first moved into this particular house... I had a, a terrible feeling almost immediately. I remember not being able to sleep as my bedroom door just kept opening and closing as I stared at it just all night long. This house is not super old. I believe that it was built in the 50s I think. I do know though that it was one of the oldest areas of our city. Over the six years that I lived in the house, I had multiple smaller unexplained incidences occur. Nothing too flash. Just... Doors opening and closing, knocking on the bathroom door when home alone, the footsteps from upstairs if we were in the basement. Most things seemed fairly harmless, so I would either just ignore it or just accept it. I did start sleeping with my dog in my room, however, as I felt the worst when I was in there. So my sister and her friend down the road had bought a Ouija board and planned to use it at the park near our house. This was during the summer and it was on a break from college. I invited my friend over for the weekend as my parents were out of town and I had the house to myself. My sister had left the board at our house in our breezeway that weekend. And when I saw it there, 
It sparked a conversation with my friend about the different strange occurrences that we've had in general in this house. And together we thought, hey, why not just try the Ouija board out? We both thought that it would be best to try it in the breezeway, not inside the actual house. Although, that didn't seem to make any difference in the end. Now, I'm a bit skeptical with the Ouija board and at the time, I did not really take it too seriously. I thought that my friend could be moving it or we both might just be subconsciously moving it in some way. I remember asking my mum if she ever used it before when I was younger and she simply said yes, don't ever try it, ever. But apparently her warning did not deter me. My sister came home later that night and we all tried the Ouija board together. I don't really remember anything too eventful or freaky happening when we used it to be honest. Just the fact that the planchette was moving was kind of creepy enough though I guess. We called it a night though and we just went to sleep. We all slept in the basement on the floor as that's what we usually did during sleepovers and we were too afraid to sleep alone anyways after spending most of the night telling scary stories and using the board and all that. And here is where the weird stuff starts. The next morning I heard a loud crash noise. I figured my dog jumped on the counter and knocked over some dishes in the kitchen or something and while my friend and my sister were still sleeping, I went upstairs to clean up the mess so my dog wouldn't eat it or get cut up by the glass or anything. Well, when I got there, there were no broken dishes. I was confused and started to feel a, a bit nervous, thinking maybe that someone had broken into the house or something. But both doors were still locked so... I took a deep breath and went to the top floor to see if anything was there. We have a window at the top of the stairs that is a double pane and it's sort of a, a doubled window in general. It's like a, an outside window and then a screen and then an inside window. I'm not sure if this is how they used to do windows but it was always kind of odd. Anyways, the inside window is shattered and the broken glass has been knocked out towards the inside of the house. And when I saw this... I felt sick to my stomach and ran to the basement to wake up my friend and sister to help. We all went upstairs together and cleaned up the mess and we tried to speculate on different things like wind pressure shifting off the house but it just seems too weird that only this one inside window broke and that the glass was pushed inside the house. After we had calmed down a bit we looked around the rest of the house to make sure nothing else fell or was out of place. All looked okay so we had breakfast and the rest of the morning was fairly normal. Later in the day though we decided to walk to the local 7-Eleven to get some snacks. I'd say that we were gone all of 20 minutes. When we got back we went into the living room area where the piano was. My friend loves piano and singing so a lot of the time that we would hang out it would be us trying to learn songs on the piano and stuff. There are two separate pictures on top of my piano too and one is of myself and one is of my sister. When we went into that room, I noticed that both of these pictures were upside down. I thought it was really weird and I went to them to turn them over but when I tried, I noticed that the actual picture inside of the frame had been removed, turned upside down and placed back into the frame. We spent the next 20 minutes trying to blame each other for doing this but came to the conclusion that we had really been together the whole day and it would have been very noticeable if one of us went into the room to change the pictures as it's an open concept house. At least one of us would have definitely noticed anyway. One other thing that was kind of odd too was that my dog who is usually fairly independent was basically glued to us at the hip that day. All of this left us all really extremely uneasy and we decided to leave the house for the weekend to stay at my friend's instead. I know it doesn't sound like a lot and I'm not 100% sure that it was the Ouija board that instigated the events but I do know that it's just something that I'll never forget. And I definitely will not try that Ouija board again. I'm not too sure if it was something we let in or if it was something existing but my parents still live in that house and I still feel very uneasy whenever I go there.
So I grew up in a really old house located in a, a small town in Iran. This house had four rooftops, four basements, two massive yards and three separate parts for living. My great grandfather, his siblings and all their children used to live in this house too. But by the time that I was born, it was only my family. We were five members and we were the only ones living there. So, most part of the house was deserted and it was really scary at the time. The house being home to many bats made it even scarier too, but the worst part was that there were around 15 people buried in the basements, all family members from the time of my great-grandfather and before that. Most of them were children, mind you, too. It seems like in the old ages when children would die of illness upon being born or something like that, their parents would just bury them in their home. So the house was pretty creepy, but the town was also really creepy. Nearly all its population believed that this town was home to jinns. There were stories about seeing these jinns all over the place. A jinn is basically a demon from the Islamic faith. And so, during the 10 years that I lived in that house, there were many times that me and my family had seen shadows passing and things just being misplaced. The sound of footsteps and all that other haunted stuff. But we had gotten mostly used to it. But there's a particular memory that I remember very vividly and I'd like to share that with you. So when I was 9 years old, I was playing hide and seek with my siblings and cousins. I was the seeker and there was this room with a huge window with pink curtains. The window would open to a hallway and I was standing in the hallway. The window was open and I saw a very vivid white hand just grabbing onto the curtains. I was sure that it was my sister's hand and I stood there for a bit just watching the hand, laughing with myself about how foolish my sister was that she had revealed where she was hiding like that. I went into the room and there was no one by the window. I searched the whole room top to bottom because I was sure that she was there but I didn't find anyone. And then, I ran out of the room and started screaming my lungs out. And my siblings and cousins came out of their hiding places and no one had hidden anywhere near that room. To this day, I'm still haunted by the image of that ghastly hand. So... Since this happened, I'm actually quite scared to go camping again, especially to those parts. The whole experience was so extremely eerie that I just hesitate to go back. Some people mention that this could be the work of a, a Wendigo or a Skinwalker, but I really just want some assurance that what I experienced was nothing of the sort so I can go back to hiking at peace again. I just want to ask this as well, but is there any way at all to defend yourself from them? Here in Europe, it's quite impossible to get a firearm license, unless you're a, a registered hunter or something for that country, so it's pretty much impossible. Anyway, I'm pretty sure that people who go camping a lot will agree with me that the forest at night is a, a pretty creepy place. Lots of sounds that you couldn't connect to any animal and lots of strange things just happen out there. I usually dismiss them as wind or just a weird echo but about five years ago I went camping in the southern Alps and I set my tent just inside the tree line. After about two days of being there and exploring the nature, hiking and doing a bit of caving too, I started to feel like something was just around me. Not like following me, but that something was just all around. I thought that I was just tired and dehydrated, but when the night fell on the third day, I was laying in my tent and I started to hear branches breaking and leaves just moving really unnaturally. It's quite common for branches to break under their own weight or because they're rotten, but when I woke up and checked the trees, there were marks on them at about 15 feet high. Not just one tree too, but a lot of them. On the five trees around my tent, there were also scratches at the same height. Obviously, I was pretty scared at that point because I have no idea if some local was playing a prank on me or 
if there was something more sinister going on. I had a knife to defend myself with, but I quickly packed nonetheless, being a five-foot woman that barely weighs 120 pounds, and I wasn't going to take any chances. I checked the trees and floor for the last time, and there were no footprints or any disturbed foliage, which meant that whatever it was, it came from the trees and didn't touch the ground, even once. Also, after I started heading back to the valley, I heard this just really strange noise. It was like a deer, but way higher pitched and mixed with a, a man's voice. The noise cut straight to the bone, and at that point, I don't even think Usain Bolt could have caught me. I didn't look back once, and even though I'm not religious, I grasped my crucifix that my grandma gave me so hard that my palms started to bleed. You have no idea how shitty and messed up the whole situation was, and the worst thing of it all was that no one believed me. After asking the locals if there were people living up there or if there was ever anything shady going on, they just ignored me and started to avoid eye contact. Anyway, thanks in advance for any answers you guys might be able to give. I appreciate it. So I want to tell you guys about a house that my wife and I lived in for a little over a year that we're pretty sure was actually haunted. Well, I feel it was haunted and my wife would just smile and roll her eyes when I would blame the weird noise or occurrence on the ghost. I feel it should be noted too that some of these things could have been real tangible causes but there was just so much that was so unexplainable that I just don't know. So... My wife and I moved to Clayton NC for work and we lived in this house for about a year and a few months I think. It's a one story house that sat on the corner of a lot in a very normal looking cookie cutter neighbourhood and we didn't get to view it before moving because we had to move so quickly. We had to take what we could get really and this was the best that we could do. We have since moved to a new house but not because of the haunted house that I'm about to tell you about. I should also tell you guys that this house wasn't old and it wasn't in any way creepy and I think a part of its unassuming nature is what made this whole thing all the more stranger. Because I don't recall the order of all the things that occurred, I'm just going to list the instances. So, at the first, a full disclosure, we have six cats so we know when we hear things crashing and falling and breaking that it's 99% of the time going to be them. It's just what happens with cats, but in these incidences, we'd hear, and yes, both my wife and me, what sounded like the most epic of all crashes, but upon searching the entire house, garage included, and there was absolutely nothing. Nothing was out of place or broken or anything. This happened a few times at the beginning too, and it was just really strange. The second was uh, footsteps in the attic. Yeah, that's right. And that was really creepy. In fact, the footsteps were heard so often and so distinctly that when I had a maintenance guy over, I asked him to check it out and see if it looked like someone was living up there. He said it didn't and that it was probably just natural sounds from the house, but my wife and I begged to differ. On one occasion, we were both in the closet hanging up clothes and then there were all these stomps right above our head. And we just looked at each other like, what the fuck? I mean, it was so loud that we even put our phones on a selfie stick and stood on a stepladder and recorded what we saw in the attic. We didn't see anything unusual, which I guess is ultimately good, but it was seriously really creepy. One day, I was working from home and just chatting with my friends about my haunted house when all of a sudden, the picture that was on the wall just sort of popped off. Full disclosure, it was a heavier than normal frame, but nothing happened to make it jump off like that. No loud bangs or disturbances or anything. Just one second it's up there and the next it's on the floor with the nail still on the wall. I hesitate to put this next one in here because I really think that it's probably just the electrical work in the house but the microwave light would sometimes flicker and towards the end of our stay at the house I changed the light bulb for the porch light that would flicker like mad. 
like a strobe light, and then it would just stop and either work right or not at all. One of our guest rooms too had bad wiring or something because the light in there would just not turn on, or so we thought. One time, I left the switch in the on position not realizing it, and when we got up in the morning, the light was on. So, for this next one, I'm going to do my best to describe this. So, we had an air vent that was about uh, three foot in height, I think, and about two feet wide. It was a decent size, and certainly something a person could get into if they weren't overweight or anything. It was located at the bottom of the wall towards the floor, too. Well, one day, we got home and I noticed that the heavy piece of furniture that we had sitting in front of the vent was scooted out a bit more. I assumed that my wife had moved it, or something or other, and just forgot to put it back in place. But when I asked her, she said that she hadn't moved it. Upon further inspection, I noticed the little clasps to the air vent were almost completely undone too, like it had been opened. This was obviously really creepy too, because my first thought was not, this is a ghost. My first thought was, who's been in my house? My best logical guess could be a maintenance guy or something, even though I'm pretty sure that it'd be close to illegal for them to just enter the house without us knowing ahead of time anyway. And it wasn't like the filter was changed or anything. I mean, I would have thought that if it were maintenance, the filter would have at least been changed or something. Either way, that was a, a bit disturbing. So, this next one was the one that absolutely scared me the most. So my wife and I were in bed and I think we were watching TV or something. I think it was quiet and she was either reading or we were on our phones or something too. Pretty quiet and then we just both heard a whistle in the hallway closest to the front door. But it was definitely coming from inside the house because it sounded nearby. It wasn't a long song or anything, it was just sort of a, a single note but man we both just looked at each other terrified I froze and I'm pretty sure a tear came to my eye too because what the actual fuck and upon further investigation there was absolutely no one there nothing there nothing was turned on to make the noise no TVs no radios no electronics nothing of any kind and to this day we have no idea what that was, but it sounded exactly like someone whistling. Since moving to our new house, which does actually look older and like it is more historical or something, we've not had anything else happen since then. No crashing, no noises, no flickering lights, so this house is definitely not haunted. But thanks for listening guys, and I've been meaning to tell this to someone and just haven't had the time. It's nice to be able to get it off my chest. My parents claim that when I was younger, I had an imaginary friend. I didn't think that this was anything special since plenty of kids supposedly have them anyway, but I couldn't remember anything about having one, so I thought that they were joking when they had mentioned it in passing. They looked at me very seriously though when I told them that I had no clue what they were going on about. And they then asked me, are you sure you don't remember anything? And I shook my head. I really had no clue. So, they told me about my imaginary friend, Jin or Gin. I have no idea how to spell the name. I only know that that's what it sounded like. And frankly, I don't know what to think about it. My parents are superstitious, being Filipino and all, and it just kind of runs in our culture. So when I'd started talking into empty spaces and asking to set an extra plate of food at the table at around the age of two or three, my parents felt like something was up. I was an only child at the time, so they brushed off having an imaginary friend as some sort of coping mechanism for whenever I was lonely, but they still had their worries of course. He followed me around from our home in the Philippines all the way to the UK where we are now, which eased them a bit, having been used to hearing stories about ghosts inhabiting homes and whatnot. So they were sure that it was just my active imagination. It wasn't until I started calling him a ghost and complaining about only having ghosts to speak to that they really got worried. 
It was this that spurred them into thinking about having some more kids sooner rather than later, and around a year later, I was told that I was going to be a big sister. They thought that this would cause my friend to leave, but it was uh, ultimately to no avail. If anything, actually, things just got weirder. My mother started experiencing strange things in our home. She used to hear running in the hallway, she'd have frequent nightmares, photographs would just fall right off the wall at night and only at night, and I started reporting weird things too, like cutlery floating and my toys making sounds by themselves, all sorts of weird stuff. One time that really stood out to my mother was when she'd taken me with her to a handover in the hospital to then pass me off to my dad who was finishing his shift. Supposedly, we'd been walking down a corridor when I'd stopped walking when we got to a set of stairs and I just pointed to the top, asking her why there was a lady without a head. I was still very young at this point, so I was more curious than anything, but my mother was obviously terrified. So she rushed me to find my dad and ran us out of the hospital as quickly as possible. After my sister was born, I spent less and less time with my imaginary friend and I was busy having started school at this age and a little sister to look after and all. I loved the responsibility and had fun pouring their formula and looking after them when my parents were cooking and all that fun stuff. So when my mother got pregnant again and my little brother was born, they had almost forgot about my imaginary friend. And then I started to get ill. My attendance went down at primary school and it got so bad that my parents were called in often to talk to the school about my illnesses. I was off for at least three to four weeks a year because of reoccurring flu or infection. And then, one day, a day that even I remember, my parents were downstairs cooking dinner and I was upstairs looking after my siblings. One moment, I'm playing Super Mario on my Game Boy. The next, I hear multiple thuds all the way down the stairs before silence and a loud cry from downstairs. And when I leave the room, I notice that the baby gate at the stairs was open and my sister was crying at the bottom of the stairs. My parents rushed her to hospital and thankfully she only had a few bruises and otherwise she was fine. They thought that I forgot to close the gate but when it happened again, only to my younger brother, they started to wonder if it was really my fault. It wasn't by the way because after my sister's initial fall, I got so scared that I always made sure to check that damn gate when they asked me to look after them again. For a good while, I really did think it was my fault too, but I remember checking those gates and I remember them being closed every time and so when my brother fell, I had no idea what to say to my parents except sorry, which was probably a sure sign of guilt to them. Then one day, just out of the blue, I told them that Jin or Gin said that he was going to go home now. When they asked me where Jin or Gin was going to go or if there was a reason why, I only shrugged my shoulders and they kept asking more questions but all I could say was that he was going home, that he wasn't going to stay here anymore. Things quietened down after that too and supposedly they stopped altogether when we moved houses. I had no idea that everything before those falls had occurred. I don't remember having an imaginary friend and I don't remember speaking to him. I don't remember the hospital or any of the cutlery moving either. So much of this was news to me that I really thought that my parents were just making it up, but they will swear by each of these experiences to the death of them. Even my grandparents agreed with them when we visited them in the Philippines that even when I was very young, this Jin or Gin was an invisible playmate that everyone knew of. Maybe I had a bad case of childhood amnesia or something, but it worries me that I supposedly did a lot of weird things without having any memory of it. But everyone else seems to remember like it was yesterday. I'm curious to know, though, if any of you guys have had imaginary friends like this, or know of anyone who did. I've asked all my friends and no one ever thought that they were a real thing until I told them my story. Many who I've told it to said that I was just a creepy kid and others said that Jin or Gin probably wasn't a normal imaginary friend but honestly I'm just kind of undecided if not spooked about what younger me apparently got up to.
This is a true story from an event that happened when I was just a little boy. I'm a 23 year old man who, as of late, came to remember a terrifying experience as a 7 year old kid. So back when I was in second grade, my mother and two siblings lived next door to my great grandparents in a cottage that she rented from them. But the rent was cheap and since it was beachfront property, mum got a real bargain. I lived in the main house given the limited amount of room in the cottage. It was spring break and mum and I were the only people around the property. But my brother and sister were visiting my aunt and younger cousins and I was offered a choice to go too but I opted out because there was this Godzilla movie marathon all week and I'm a huge fan of the monster and I just couldn't pass it up. Two nights later mum had finished cleaning up the table and I helped with the dishes. Shortly after that I curled up on the living room couch to watch Godzilla. I must have fallen asleep during the movie though because everything in the house was off and mum was already in bed. At least, that's what I could gather anyway. In the lower story of the house, the kitchen tile and the living room carpet were separated by a rubber border that was used to seal the tile and cover the carpet tack strip. The only two animals we had in the house were an Australian shepherd who was called Tucker, which easily weighed 60 pounds, and Smokey, a puffy black calico cat which never came downstairs. Now, old Tucker had long toenails that would click on wood top stairs. He also would make quite a ruckus if he came down the steps because he was a decent sized dog. As I was laying there, I heard a, a sick slapping sound like that my palms would make when I drum on the tile flooring in the kitchen. Now, if mum was in the kitchen making herself a snack, she would have turned on the light to see. But there were no lights and there was definitely no mum standing in the kitchen. Nobody at all. I cover my head with my blanket and stay perfectly still and... Then there's another smacking sound of flesh slapping on the tile. This one was closer than before too and I listened and counted four distinct slaps. Whatever it was, it had to have been on all fours and it kept going until the smacking was replaced by the soft padding of feet on carpet. I then heard breathing inches from my face before the source of the sound just moved away and I think went up the stairs. I stayed awake under the covers until dawn because it scared the shit out of me and when mum came downstairs and seemed surprised by my disheveled appearance, she claimed that I came upstairs in the middle of the night trying to wake her up by snarling like Godzilla. I never moved from the couch that night and even as I type this, it gives me chills. I didn't even realize how messed up this was at the time, but looking back, man, I feel kind of lucky. I haven't really had many encounters like this in my life because I'm a chubby male, so creepers just tend to leave me alone. When I was 19, I lived in Kentucky, but pretty far away from my northern Michigan hometown. It was this little town called Pikeville, where there was very little crime, and I actually kind of miss it and I want to go back, but I digress. My family came down to visit me for my birthday that year and we agreed to meet up at the Hardys in town the morning after they got in. I got there a lot earlier than them, me being the type to show up 15 minutes early to everything and them being the types to show up way late. As I was standing outside waiting though, this guy walks up to me. If you've ever lived in a place like this, then you know everyone is super friendly, so it didn't strike me as odd when he started to talk to me. During our conversation, all kinds of alarm bells should have been going off. Like, after he found out that I went to college, he said he saw me at a party. This is impossible, as I never really once went to a party. When he found out that I was a gamer nerd, he started talking about playing Dungeon and Dragons all the time. He kept taking sips out of some sort of alcohol bottle. Mind you, it's like 10am at this point and he kept offering me some. There were a few other things like this but I think you get the drift. He started talking about how he lost all his friends because he got into drugs and I felt a little bad for him if I'm being honest. He asked if I wanted to walk around for a bit and since I knew my family wouldn't be there for a while, I went. The guy had been talking about how he lost all his friends due to drugs and I felt bad for the guy. That, 
coupled with the fact that I hadn't had any encounters like this and the lack of crime, it kind of disarmed that warning part of my brain. We walked and talked for a little while, maybe 10 minutes, before I realized that we were now in a shady looking part of town. I had never even realized that there were shady parts of this small town, but here we were. We stopped in front of a house that looked long abandoned with this dark, narrow, sketchy alley next to it. He starts talking about how he knows two girls that live here and how they like to party and whatnot. He tells me about how DTF they are and asks if I want to meet them. It was at this point that my common sense finally kicks in. I mean, I'm in a shitty part of town with a sketchy guy that I don't know who was just talking about doing hard drugs, and no one knows that I'm here too. And now, he wants me to go into an obviously abandoned house under the guise of meeting some ladies? I obviously declined this offer and immediately said that I needed to get back as my family was probably waiting. He seemed a little upset about this and then asked if I could help him move a pool table into his van which was conveniently parked down the alley. I declined this as well, and this is when he began to reach into his jacket pocket. Since those bells started going off, I realized just how much this guy looked like he was going to stab me, and this terrified me. At that moment, my stepmom did the only kind thing that she's ever done for me. She called to see where I was. I took this as an opportunity to hastily exit, and the creep followed me for like three blocks. To this day, I don't know exactly what this guy wanted, but it was probably just to rob me. But still, that area has a good amount of disappearances and is one of the worst areas in the county for human trafficking apparently. I only found this out afterwards. I don't know what would have happened had I agreed to help, but... I can't help but think of that one scene from Silence of the Lambs where Bill lures a victim into his van. I do hope that he got the help he needed and is doing better, but I also hope just as much that I never have the misfortune of running into someone like that again. This happened several years ago, I think, and... I must have been around 15 at the time. So, it's a long drive to our holiday home. Usually, the ride takes about uh, two and a half hours. On this particular Friday, the major motorway nearby had been closed off. And this meant that all of that traffic was now crammed onto the back roads that we take to get to where we were going. It's also the middle of summer, so our windows are down and everyone is aggravated. We get to this long stretch of road and it's very slow moving. Despite looking ahead and seeing an open road with this odd car from the front heading away from our direction. This is also in the middle of nowhere and it's just a road everyone is using to try and beat the traffic. There are heavy trees down both sides and about 25 meters away from the road and there are several bushes along the grass between the road and the tree line. We get to the front of this queue and there's a man standing in the middle of the road blocking our path, arms spread wide. He walks over to my dad who is driving and asks him to get out of the car and help him move his car which has rolled into a ditch. He also looks at me and my sister in the back of the car and says that he has three children in the back of his car all crying their eyes out. And those were exactly the words he used. Now this is really odd because the car doesn't look to be stuck just parked close to the bushes on a downward slope. It was getting late, but it was still relatively light, and there was visibly nobody in the car. And the windows on his car, they were down as well. And if there were kids crying, we definitely would have heard them. My dad picks up on this and apologizes and tells the man no, as he has kids of his own to look after. The guy insists and says that his wife is getting wound up with the heat as well. He asks again for my dad to get out of the car and help him push. Again, my dad tells him no, to which the guy responds, Okay, but I'm not letting anyone else pass me until they help. My dad then speeds off relatively quickly and I turned around to see the guy 
just standing arms wide, blocking the cars behind us. I remember asking my dad why he didn't stop and help, and he told me that he just got a bad vibe from the guy. I asked him about the crying kids, and my mother said that she couldn't hear anything either, and none of us did. It's possible that this guy was just genuinely in trouble, but the whole situation, it just doesn't make any sense to me, and it creeped me out for a while after it too. I mean, if he did have a wife and kids with him, where were they? And if his children were crying their eyes out, why couldn't we hear them? In my mind, I think the whole thing was just a setup for a carjacking. I was working the night shift and was still training with my FTO. I was in phase 2 of 4 at the time. We get dispatched to the southern end of the city. and It's a cove that goes up alongside a mountain and is very dark. A reference, suspicious activity. Well, the house in question was the scene of a dead body call a few months prior. A very nasty one where the body was left undisturbed for weeks before a call. The neighbours reported the sound of talking, banging, laughing and crying from at least four people. Well, my FTO and I arrived without trouble and I parked the marked unit down the street with the lights off and the windows down and we heard distinct talking coming from the building. We were out of sight from the building and neither one of us had ever responded to the house prior to that night so we didn't know what it looked like. My FTO looked at me and said the typical training officer thing of what are you going to do trainee? I told him that he and I will make our approach and ask for an additional since it sounds like we're outnumbered. And that's exactly what we did. As we approached the house on foot, the house was completely dark and the windows were boarded up with a city notice indicating the house was not safe for human occupation. Figuring that it was just a bunch of tweakers, we stood by for the additional unit before thoroughly searching. After the unit arrived, we searched the surrounding area of the house which led into desert but we were unable to find any footprints or people. We turned our attention back to the house and entered the building through the back. I took point and I announced our presence and heard shuffling inside the building. I indicated to my partners that I heard shuffling and my FTO agreed as he was by the door prepared to open it. And the smell... It was horrible. It reeked. The house was pitch black as we entered and I turned to my left and held my position as my partner followed in. We were standing on the outline left by the corpse rotting from a few weeks prior in fact. And none of us had been to the house before so we were disorientated inside the pitch black room. My partner shined his light down the hallway after we secured the entryway and he immediately started running down the hallway telling whatever he saw to stop. My FTO and I followed suit and we were led into the master bedroom where we stopped. My partner was thoroughly confused and told the FTO and I what he had seen. Apparently, he saw a white face, about 4'11 from the ground, just grin at him and turn around heading into the master bedroom. The room was empty though, clear of all furniture and we searched the rest of the house and found nothing. Not even an animal. Well... We exited the house and left and about two hours later, we received the same call again. Again, we searched and found nothing. The next morning, we reviewed the body cam from the partner and saw what appeared to be half a face. We also reviewed the audio and found several murmurings in the background that we didn't hear at the time. Unfortunately, those videos were discarded after 180 days since the call did not lead to any arrest or public contact. But I can assure you that what we saw on that body cam, it freaked me the hell out. This is going to be pretty long, so I apologize for that. But I'm trying to include as, as much information as I can. As far as I know, the creature has never tried harming me, but it has oftentimes made me feel unsafe and threatened. As the years have passed, I've begun paying less mind to it and just putting the feeling in the back of my mind. 
In January of 2012, I bought a horse and began boarding it at a, a very old barn. It was a small, tight-knit, friendly barn community not far from my home. It had been around since the 60s, surrounded by woods. There were three barns and the main area was entirely surrounded by thick woods and there were small trails in the woods behind the property. Fast forward to June of 2012 and I had two horses there now. I was there every single day without fail too. At 2pm to 10pm and I fed the horses and just cared for them and stuff. I rode one every night as well, mainly in the arena but sometimes in the barnyard. There were no field or arena lights, just the moon and the stars. One evening, around 5pm I think, I was just sitting on her, letting her stand when she started snorting and backing up. I looked up and I saw this white or grey creature crawling out of the woods towards us. It had a, a very small round head and its eyes were just pits. It had a, a very small mouth and not much detail there. Its arms were really long and thin, fingers also like that. Its ribcage was also really pronounced and defined and its legs were long and lanky. Its movements were really jerky, but not smooth and fluid. And it slowly jerked out to us when my horse just turned and bolted out of the arena. She's a dead broke, calm and well-mannered horse who never spooked before this. I mean, she's a stubborn old mare, but not spooked. And she would not go back into the arena that night. I walked her around the barnyard, staying near the main barn and put her up and ran out to peek into the arena to find nothing, except some footprints where I saw the thing. Throughout summer, I saw it peeking, almost dancing if that's the right word, around the gate that leads into the woods where the trails were. One night, roughly a month later, at about 9pm, I was riding that horse again in a front pasture. The moon is full and bright and I look to my left to see the creature running full spread by my side on the other side of the fence. I slowed my horse to a stop and it took off around the barn and behind the side of the barn and into the woods. And I continued seeing mainly in the woods but it was always around summer of 2013 and the barn shut down when the owner died we moved the horses to a friend's place for the time being and i didn't see it there late summer and fall of 2013 i found a new barn and the woods were directly behind the barn in the arena again this place actually had lights and was much newer about a month later when i was getting ready to leave I heard something in the woods again. I looked down the barn aisle into the woods and saw the creature running down the road into the woods. I saw it much less frequently for a while until later in the fall of 2014 when I began seeing it in the back pastures of woods again and it darted in and out of the tree line. I saw a second one too sitting in a neighbor's yard and it would sit in the same spot every day and just watch me ride. I actually started taking pictures which are really poor and crappy quality and sent them to a friend who claimed that he and some others had seen it too. I kept seeing it occasionally too but from a much greater distance than at the first barn. I went with this barn owner to another farm to get some stuff when I saw a very very large version of this creature run out from the woods right behind a tree that I was 10 feet from while I was alone by the trailer. Last November, I house sat for the barn owners too. I went out around, I think it was about 2am, to fill some water troughs and enjoy the full moon and cool night. I was sitting in the back pasture when three of the creatures began coming from the woods. One came up to the trees near the trough where I was and the other two were just walking along the tree line. The horses were silently munching their hay this time, but pretty far from where the creature was and... I messaged the guy from earlier and told him what was going on. And since that incident, I haven't really seen them. Last summer though, I actually did see one outside my house, staring into the windows. And a few weeks ago, one was outside my bedroom window, tapping and making a, a strange, faint, shrieking sound.
So, before some backstory on my family, my mum, she grew up rather poor in a junkyard in the country in northern Wisconsin. But for anyone who isn't familiar with Wisconsin, this is the part of Wisconsin that tends to have long stretches of forests and a lot of beautiful nature and scenic views. The most noteworthy of all the stories that I'm about to share, however, is the family of ghosts. My mum and her siblings grew up on a junkyard that was apparently a shoe factory back in the day. When it would rain, sometimes testaments of the property's past would wash up, usually old shoes and the like. I vaguely recall my mum mentioning a fire or something to that effect for the old factory, but I'm not sure if anyone actually died, and if they did, who they were is anyone's guess. However, in the little house they lived in, my uncles all shared their room, and it seems like they all have their own story about waking up and seeing this ghost family, as they would describe it. Usually, all of my uncle's stories follow a, a similar thing. They would wake up in the middle of the night and, at the foot of their bed, find three people just staring at them. Apparently, there was a father, a mother, and a young daughter, and they were all dressed up in old-timey clothing. My cousin Terry apparently decided to test this too, as my grandfather still lived in the house years later, and allegedly, she was able to see the family as well. It doesn't seem like they actually did anything too malevolent, other than creep my uncles out and... I'm not sure if it relates to them specifically, but my mum described how she felt unwelcome many times in the house, and at one point, I heard someone shout at her to get out. This, compounded with the abuse of my grandfather, who also beat my grandmother, I believe helped spurn my mum into leaving sooner rather than later. I'm unsure if this is also related, but when my uncles were fairly young, my grandma would go into them and read them a bedtime story. When she was going into the room, there was some sort of light that slowly went up into the ceiling. Needless to say, she was rightfully freaked out by this, but considering their financial difficulties, there wasn't really much that they could do, even if they wanted to move out. I suspect that my mum had more experiences in that house, and she simply hasn't told me too much. When I was younger, I had experiences in multiple houses that we lived in, but... For a long time, my mum didn't react to me well and would get upset, saying our house wasn't haunted. In hindsight, I'm not sure if she was emotionally and mentally prepared for the fact that she might be faced with similar experiences again. As for the house, I've been in it a few times before my grandfather died, and to put it bluntly, I did not know that my step-grandfather, as my grandma remarried before I was born, wasn't my biological grandfather until I was eight or nine, when I found out that I suddenly had a third grandpa. I was never in the house for too long, and I never got any particular vibes from it, but I've only ever been in the living room and kitchen for short periods of time. The house has since been sold and torn down after my grandfather's death, however, and I'm not sure what has been done with the property since, but I'd be curious if a house has been built on it, and if so if they had experienced anything. Anyway, one other story that my mum told me was something that happened to a family that had apparently lived nearby. There was a family driving through the forest and eventually their car broke down. This would have been in the, in the 70s or 80s, I think, before cell phones were widespread, so they ended up getting out of their vehicle and making the journey home on foot. Eventually, however they started to notice sounds from behind them, as if something was following them through the woods, or, perhaps more aptly put, stalking them through the woods. When they ran, it ran, and when they stopped, it stopped. Eventually, they were able to get to their house, however, and they quickly entered, slammed the door, and locked it. And whatever was following them gave out a bellowing scream. Apparently the family had alerted my grandfather as to what happened and told him to look into his fields. According to my mum, he had apparently come back into the house, wide-eyed and alarmed, but he didn't elaborate on what he saw. I vaguely recall my mum talking about him seeing some sort of glow in the field. And I'm unsure if it's related, but my oldest uncle went horseback riding with a friend and they apparently came across a thing, as they called it. 
It was white and furry, and when it saw my uncle and Mike and his friend, it stood up on its hind legs and bounded a fence and just ran off. Apparently, it left behind some fur too, which my uncle collected, but this was many, many years ago, and my uncle died when I was about four years old in a bad accident, so I'm unable to ask him about the story. I'm unsure if both of these stories are related or not, and there could be some natural causes to this, like a black bear or a wolf or a dog, all would be living in the area, that's for sure. However, judging by the tone of the story and the fact that such animals are rather commonplace and it was apparently during the day, I'm not sure if it would be mistaken identity or not. But what does interest me, however, is the stories of the Wendigo, which... I've heard some depictions being somewhat furry from Canada, skinwalkers and the Wisconsin and Michigan dogman. Could it be related if it was not a case of mistaken identity? I don't know. I honestly don't really care to find out too much either. All I can say is just be careful in the woods. Mother Nature can be a cruel mistress and there is darkness in this world, be it supernatural or the very, very real depths of human depravity and cruelty. Please, protect yourselves and your loved ones too. I'm an environmental educator at a nature preserve, so I spend a lot of time outdoors in sometimes isolated areas. There's one area of the park that I try not to take groups of kids on anymore. Once in a while, we have to go through that trail since it's a shortcut to the kayak launch and when it's 95 degrees outside, you're ready for anything that'll make your trip shorter. But when I started there, one of the first things I did was to familiarize myself with all the areas of the preserve. So, I spent quite a bit of time hiking through all the trails, even rarely used ones since I have to know my way around to navigate this group or go rescue someone if they get lost, which happens from time to time. One part of the preserve is an old homestead site of a, a now abandoned pineapple plantation. It was settled in the 1890s and we don't know much about the family beyond the name and the approximate year they settled there and the approximate year the homestead was abandoned. This is in southern Florida and there are thousands of similar abandoned homestead sites here. The early settlers of that area, they had to be tough as nails. This was pre-railroad area and the nearest town was about five miles south through what would have been wilderness with no real roads. So these guys were on their own in a land absolutely bursting with mosquitoes, panthers, bears and bad water. The water table is high and fresh water can be easily contaminated by the salt water nearby. In other words, early homesteaders were badasses because that was the only way they'd survive. So... There's this narrow trail through what was once the homestead site. On one of my first days, I decided to trek through here. I got about half a mile in when I started to get some really weird vibes. I've always been sensitive to my surroundings and have spent enough time in isolated natural areas to know that if something doesn't feel right, it probably means your instincts are picking up on something that you should pay attention to. Usually, this means your brain is picking up on minute movements on the ground that indicate an unfriendly snake may be nearby or another animal you don't want to confront. And while the panthers are nearly gone, we've got aggressive wild boars and bobcats that freely roam. So, I stopped dead in my tracks and let my mind go quiet, looking around carefully for any warning signs. There weren't any and I didn't see any tracks, but the bad vibe feeling was still there. I just shrugged it off and kept going, the trail getting narrower and the bad vibes just kept growing deep in my gut. I felt like I was being watched and followed and this is an isolated area so the possibility that a person was following me was very remote but possible still. I stopped every few meters but there were no sounds, actually none at all, not even birds. I started to sweat and my heart started to race and one thought kept echoing in my mind. You're not welcome here. You need to turn around because you're not welcome. Well, screw that I thought. I'm just jittery from the nerves of a new job. 
I came to a bend in the trail and I stopped and my feet just wouldn't go any further. In my mind, the phrase just got louder and louder. You're not welcome here. And then, I heard a crashing coming from behind me. But when I turned to investigate, there was no one there. No animal, no human, nothing. And the vegetation was sparse enough that I would have definitely been able to see something. Well, after that, I turned around and left. I put it down to nerves or me being a wimp or something and just sort of forgot about it. About a month later though, I'm taking a camp group through the kayak launch where our kayaks await us. I decide to take the kids through the narrow trail to save us about 10 minutes and we get to the same bend of the trail and the kids have all gone silent. These are 9 year olds in summer camp and believe you me, they are not silent, never silent. but. I look behind me to one kid who looks as though he's scared shitless. He says, I don't like it here and I asked him why not. And he looked me dead in the eye and said, I just feel like we shouldn't be here. I couldn't turn around at that point so we hustled to the kayak launch and all was well but we were all a, a little on edge. I took another group through the trail a week later and again... The kids were silent at the bend in the trail. For that whole summer too, whenever I took the shortcut, kids would just go silent and I'd get those really bad vibes again. These days, I try not to go down that stretch of trail anymore if I can help it. Obviously, this is nothing more than a gut feeling on my end, but only a few other times in my life have I felt a gut feeling about a place that strongly. I don't know if it's paranormal related or if something else is there and it's just really hard to describe but it doesn't want people trespassing there, if that makes sense. As far as I know, no one's ever been hurt there but it seems to make everyone feel the same way, like you're not welcome. Before I dive into this story, I would like to say that everything I'm about to share is 100% the truth, or at least the truth from my perspective. I don't really talk about this incident much, but partly out of looking insane and partly out of remaining fear, so take all of this how you will. I moved into my boyfriend's house when I turned 18 and it was your average looking older suburban home. He had lived there for the majority of his life and claimed that there was a ghost in the house that he would sometimes see when he was younger. Being young and naive, I was very interested in ghosts and the paranormal at the time so I set off on some personal mission to contact this ghost. I bought an EVP and an EMF reader to better help me with this. The three places that were claimed to have the most activity were the garage, the upstairs hallway and my room, specifically inside the closet. I started in my room and, at first, I had no response or feedback. But one day though, I did eventually get some feedback on my EVP recording. In it, I was asking questions when my cat came up to me and meowed. I said her name and I could faintly hear a man's voice repeating the name of my cat, which you could hear her meowing back in response on the recording. Excited, I put up a new beaded curtain and played the move for yes and keep still for no game, which ended up working pretty well in fact and I thought then that this thing was nice. About a couple of weeks to a month later I began to feel a, a sort of presence when I entered the house and entered those rooms like that someone was watching me or something. It turned from feeling that way when I was in a certain room to feeling that everywhere I went to and the feeling was really intense too. After a while I began to feel uneasy so I would ask out loud for it to just please go away and leave me alone and at first it did but after a while it just stopped listening to me altogether. I don't know how things escalated the way they did but it started with small things like hearing footsteps walk around upstairs at 3 and 5 a.m. 
hearing small knocking sounds every once in a while and even noticing that one chair was moving to a specific spot every night. Usually, most people would brush it off and just try to ignore it, but I kept talking about it and taking such interest into the weird things that were happening in the house that I kind of became obsessed. But one day, I was with a group of friends in our garage and I saw it for the first time. It wasn't what I expected it to look like, though. It appeared in the doorway as a, a brown yellowish murky color as it started walking toward me. I looked around me to see if anyone else was noticing it too, but no one seemed to. The murky blob stopped right next to me and I could feel a, an intense sense of dread and fear running through me. It's one thing to have this happen when you're alone, but it's another when you're surrounded by people who just don't see it and you feel helpless. I began trying to calm myself with my thoughts, telling myself that it was okay and I was safe. But then, it looked like the blob was beginning to surround me. Everywhere I looked, all I could see was that brown-yellow color. And then, I began hearing a, an audible whisper in my ear saying things like, You're not safe and just give up. Honestly, at that moment, I felt like I was going insane or maybe had schizophrenia or something. But after that, the activity, it just got worse. I stopped sleeping in my room and began sleeping in the same room as my boyfriend because anytime I slept, it felt like someone was watching me sleep. Things began moving a lot more too and friends that came over would lose things like wallets and find it two weeks later out in the open where we had already searched dozens of times, mind you. I would leave the room just to come back to find the couch cushions and pillows thrown all over the living room floor. The shower head would move by itself, even when guests or friends came over. But people would tell us about seeing a shadow person following them in the hallway. But sometimes it was also claimed to look like a, a little girl or a black dog. Some people even claim to see the brown yellow blob like I once saw, which I must admit made me feel a little bit better about myself, knowing that I wasn't completely crazy. Most people just stopped coming over altogether because they were just so scared of whatever was in this house. But the fear only seemed to make it stronger. The nightmares began shortly before our roommates moved in. Sometimes, before I would go to sleep, I would also faintly see a shadow of a person at the end of my bed. I would then get these dreams that a man was chasing me or sexually assaulting me. And I would then wake up to really dark bruises on my inner thighs and arms, almost like someone had grabbed me really hard. Our roommates were a newly married couple and they began sleeping in the place that I used to call my room. After a few weeks... They began telling us about the activity going on, such as feeling like someone was watching them sleep and even hearing knocking or banging on their walls. Whatever was in that house, it did not like the guy and it targeted the girl as well. One of the craziest moments that I ever witnessed was when I watched a wine glass get thrown at the guy. Luckily, the glass didn't break, but it was enough to freak us all out. But one day... I was talking with the girl when she told me about these nightmares she kept having, from seeing blood seep out of the walls to being sexually assaulted too. But coincidentally, she also happened to wake up to hand-like bruises all over her arms and thighs. I knew for some reason that this thing was specifically targeting females. I mean, we were the only two in the house and the most activity tended to happen when either one of us were alone. Sitting on the couch one day, I heard what sounded like a, a shouting match between two people coming from the garage. As I went out there, everything just stopped and no one was in the room. I decided to check in the attic because it kind of sounded like it was coming from there too and as I did, this intense get out continued to repeat over and over in my head until I felt uneasy and just left. And that's when I think I figured it all out. The places in the house with the most activity all coincidentally had attic access doors. 
everyone in the house also decided to just stop talking about it, mentioning it, or altogether thinking about it, or giving it attention. And that's why I was really scared to share this story for the longest time. We began to realize that it seemed like fear was making it stronger, but it's hard to not be afraid when all you feel is dread whenever it came around. I asked my boyfriend's mum if we could get a priest to bless the house or something, but she said that the house had already been blessed once before and one time was all that was necessary. So I bought some sage and acquired a bottle of holy water. I sprinkled the water and burned the sage, but all that seemed to do was piss it off more. I mean, I could feel it right behind me the whole time that I was burning the sage. It was following me through every room and the activity continued to just get worse afterward. The banging would get louder and the objects moving seemed to get a lot more violent. One time in particular, I was in my bedroom playing on my laptop when I felt that intense someone's watching me feeling. I continued to look at my computer screen just telling myself to ignore it when I watched the door slam shut harder than I had ever previously seen before. And the nightmares only got worse. Along with the feeling of being followed and seeing shadow people in the hallway. All because I made the mistake of messing with it in the first place. In the end, our roommates ended up moving out a few months later. And the activity just never ceased until the day we moved out. I had dealt with those horrible nightmares and things for over a year when we just finally decided to move. And... I'm confident that that thing is still in that house and I promised myself that I would never even walk by that place again. A family with a child currently live there now so man do I hope everything is okay for them but I wouldn't be surprised if that house goes back up for sale within the next year or so. So I hunt, and when I say hunt, I don't mean I sit in a tree stand. I mean I'm the guy out hunting by walking over the entire park with enough on my back to let me sleep at night, sort of comfortably, but little enough that I won't mind dragging 150 pounds of yummy out of the woods. So I'm hunting a, a fairly large forest somewhere in the northwest corridor of the US. It's not uncommon to run into other people at the edges of the woods. It's fairly uncommon to run into people in the middle of the woods, even during hunting season, unless you're on the trails, which I wasn't, and it's decently common to run into the ruins of buildings from the 1800s there. I happened to be hunting a, a new valley that I was pretty sure had a crossing in it, so to set the view, I'm sitting on top of a, a very steep shale slide, looking down into a valley with a creek running through it. Approaching this plateau... There's a knife edge that runs up and down the ridge, but there's really no way to get up to this spot except for the seriously determined, the drunk, and the foolish, without walking up or down the ridge. Getting up here creates quite a noise from the stone sliding on the other stones, which means that I know I have to sit up here for an hour to let things settle back down after I made the ascent. Since it's such a pain in the ass. I left my day pack at the bottom under a pine tree and only had a rifle, binoculars, water and an energy bar. I'm up here for about three hours, glassing this little piss of a stream, just looking for something to cross it and seeing nothing but squirrels and birds and I just finally decide to start glazing the opposite hill out of sheer boredom. I'm 90% sure that I chose a poor spot at this state and wasted an afternoon looking at nothing. Such is hunting though. It's got its really interesting days, and it's got its really boring days. And this is why it's called hunting and not shooting, I suppose. Anyway, as I'm screwing around with the focus on the binoculars, I catch a, a glimpse of something which almost looks like a, a person. If they were wearing dark blue clothes and about four feet tall... 99% of the time, the day hikers just pass by without realizing that I'm here, even with the blaze orange requirements, or they just pretend to ignore me, but you'd be amazed how many times someone has almost walked through my stand. This person though, they weren't moving, which started to make me think that I was wrong. 
It was just standing there, behind the cover of some low scrub bush and tree branches, and I would have missed it were it not for the colour. I zoom out a bit to try and get my bearings and realise that I'm not looking at a person, but it's actually a collapsed cabin, and I was looking at where the door would be. Except, it really looked like a person, and cabins aren't blue. I move the zoom back into the door and play with the focus for about five minutes, and I can't get the person to come back. In fact, the cabin door now has some light from the setting sun visible through the holes in the walls and the roof. Whatever that four foot tall thing was that I was looking at, it had moved. I end up sighing to myself and just think, we're teenagers, right? And I have that thought and then realize something else. I can hear birds and squirrels and all the other things in the woods which typically go quiet when they notice something. Which means that they didn't notice me. But that also means that they didn't notice whatever was in the cabin door a short time ago. I'm doing my best to stay quiet and not move and whatever it was, it certainly did move. I mean, I would expect everything in the woods to have gone for cover with a teenager crashing through the brush. But the noises almost made it worse. There was something moving in the brush. I started to think that it was the trick of the light since the sun was setting and it was getting to the part of the day when tree stumps look like deer. And I knew I would have to move soon and figured that I might as well just pack up since I still had to get down off the shale and back to the pine tree where I planned to throw a tarp and sleep. At this point, I realized it wasn't dark per se, but it was overcast now. Again, the creepy experience isn't that there's something obviously wrong. It's that everything is so completely normal for what I would expect were I alone. About this time too, a fog rolled into the valley, which the combination of overcast weather conditions, sunset and a ground fog coming up in the wet low valley signaled that it was definitely time to leave. I checked my safety and put the caps on my glass and reached up to take my orange flag. But the moment that I grabbed the flag, the dread came. And that's the only way that I can describe it. The woods went from animals going home to sleep to full on, you're screwed. The movement had attracted what I could only describe as a thousand invisible eyes which all turned in unison as they noticed me. You ever wonder what a deer feels like in the headlights? Well, this is it. But then, I heard children. I heard children laughing. Not teenagers, not adults, and definitely not women. But full-on five-year-old kids just laughing like they caught a firefly or something. I had hiked in five miles the previous day through woods and put two more down today when I woke up to get to this spot. And... I distinctly hear children laughing during what I can only describe as the most creepy moment that I've ever had in a valley that I know is completely unoccupied, having stared at it for the last four hours or so. I'm pretty sure that my feet only touched the shale three times getting down from the knife edge and I made a ton of noise doing it too. At this point, I just didn't really care though. I grabbed the pack and my flashlight and absolutely full on fucking rucked it to the next hilltop. I killed my light halfway up the hill too and went to the top of the hill where I just threw down a tarp and unrolled my foam and there I just sat all night watching the hill that I just came from. This isn't going to be your typical paranormal story, but it's probably the most frightening one that I've been to in 10 years, simply because of the human element. So, the call came out as a simple suspicious person at a large nursing home with not that many more details. Myself and a buddy showed up to find a woman just waiting out front next to her vehicle. The vehicle was off and she carried a baby with her, maybe three years old, but still with those uh, cherubic baby angel cheeks. The administrator tells me the woman in question, whom I'll refer to as Tracy, is a contracted worker for them. 
a sort of nurse who comes in from time to time to help out with their elderly patients. She shows up on her day off and starts talking to this elderly gentleman, Joe. Tracy places her baby in Joe's lap and wheels him out of the facility, with Joe screaming the whole time. But they stop her and she gets mad because they're holding her grandfather hostage and she just wants to take him for a walk. The only thing is, Joe is not related to Tracy and is a retired cop himself. But Tracy then gets distracted and tries stealing medication and scratches another nurse when they stop her. By all accounts, not six hours earlier, Tracy was just a, an ordinary woman. She went to work without complaint, seemed happy and then just went home. No history of drug use, no history of mental illness. The facility was reluctant to pursue charges due to the sudden abrupt shift in her personality, in fact. Like she'd been replaced with another woman who looked just like her but was criminally insane. The funny thing is, while speaking to her, Tracy seems normal. She tells me in a very calm and obviously not crazy voice what she's doing and why. She gives me all the information and doesn't cause any problems or give me reason to take her into custody. I mean, Joe didn't want to press charges and the facility declined as well. The only thing giving me cause that something was wrong was Tracy insisting Joe was her grandfather, which we proved that she was not. My only other recourse was a, a sort of emergency custody order, mental health, but I really had no reason to do so. I mean, her son looked well cared for, so we elected to call for family to arrive. Her father showed up and confirmed that Tracy was okay. She didn't take drugs and had never complained about mental health or physical ailments that would lead us to believe that something was wrong. I even spoke to a magistrate about securing charges to get her treated, since she refused to do so on her own, but he declined right off. The only option we had was the father trying to get a custody order against her. He took a few minutes speaking to her before pulling me aside, saying, I can tell you that that woman looks like my daughter, but that's not my daughter. As this is happening, I hear the car door open and the doors lock, and my stomach dropped, and I couldn't tell you why. Consider it a, a sixth sense that all cops have or are issued after time spent on the force or something. Sometimes, someone just sets off a trigger that you can't explain and you better bloody listen to it. Inside the car, Tracy is holding a bouncing little boy in her arms. I knock on the window and ask if we can talk more, but she refuses. I ask if her father can hold the baby and she tells me that's not my father. I tried to negotiate while my supervisor, who witnessed the whole thing thankfully, tried other doors. He took over talking to her while I positioned myself on the other side of the car, trying to open door handles. Both of our warning flags were going off and for some reason we just couldn't say why. I mean, she gave no reason and we had no real cause. Then, Tracy says, you're just trying to take away my baby, and she pulls the baby into her chest and the baby stops laughing. It stops breathing and the little jerks on its hands and feet tell me that it's definitely not breathing anymore. It took three good swings of my baton to break the glass, all the while my supervisor is screaming at me to get in and get in there for fuck's sake. I crawl across the broken glass and reach across the seat, pulling the baby's head from her arms. It lets out a bloody wail and Tracy turns to look me in the face. I see the driver's side door open and Tracy just smiles at me. She then says, you're just trying to take my baby, you white devil. It felt like it happened in an instant, but Tracy bears her teeth and bites down on the baby. I hear the baby screaming now in pure pain, and I reach forward, wrapping my arms around her lower jaw and upper forehead and pulled her off. Tracy goes limp, and the grandfather takes the baby inside to be treated. He lived, but we never found his ear. I saw her later in court after all the charges were dismissed in lieu of lifetime commitment to a, a mental institution, and all the life was just gone from her eyes, just like that night. The lights were on, but no one was home. I still can't explain how an otherwise healthy and vibrant person can just go from zero to crazy like that, but it haunts me to this day more than 
any ghost story that I have ever heard. So, this story takes place around the time of the housing crisis back in 2008 or so. I was in high school at the time and our buddy, I'll call Eric and myself, we would do some urban exploring by sneaking into empty homes, abandoned and foreclosed. Of course, we'd do these explorations in the dead of night to avoid any trouble with the law and all that. I can't give away the location because, well, people now live there and I really just have no scientific rational explanation for what happened but I know what I saw and heard so I'd like to share it with you all so we set out around 12 a.m. just like we would any night about an hour or so in we find a house that I often saw on my walks to school as we walk up to the house we scan for anyone and then we make our way down the large driveway that leads into the backyard of the house the first thing I noticed is how tall the grass was, like it hadn't been mowed in quite some time, months I'd say. And then I noticed a smaller house further near the back of the property. We told ourselves that we'd check that house out once we explored the bigger one that was. We entered the bigger house from the door that leads into the garage and from the garage we stepped into the kitchen and believe it or not the doors were unlocked. When we enter the kitchen, we see that the house was almost pitch black and we can only see a few feet ahead thanks to the street lights. So, I use my only light source at the time, a cheap flip phone with the screen brightness on max. We start our exploration down the hallway and check out each room, a five in total counting the two living rooms. Eric is close behind me as we walk our way through each room and eventually back to the kitchen. Once in the kitchen, we chat about how nice the house is and its size, given the area it's in, are much bigger than the surrounding houses. As we're talking, I notice a metal decoration hanging above the kitchen doorway. It almost looked like some sort of decorative shield. I pull it from its spot and inspect it closely. Once done, I can't figure out how to put it back up, so I set it in between my feet on the tile floor. I take a look at my friend and take a step into the kitchen. And then we both hear what sounds like something sliding along the floor and then a bang at the end of the hall. Eric and I, we both freeze and just stare at one another through the streetlight shining through the kitchen window. Eric whispers to me, is there someone here with us? Did someone follow us in? And I honestly didn't know, but after a minute or two, we decide to walk down the hall and see what the noise was. As my phone light creeps to the end of the wall, we see the shield that I had just pulled down. We were both relieved and I thought, well, maybe I kicked it when I stopped and just didn't notice. I picked it up and this time I figured out how it needs to be attached to its original position. Once again, I look at Eric and take a step towards him and I hear a few clangs on the floor and that familiar sliding across the floor and the bang against the wall again. And now, we're really scared and frozen, not moving for what seemed like forever. And then, an even louder bang is heard at the other end of the house and we both jump and just stare into the dark hallway. And then, again, another bang and then quiet and then three rapid bangs. Someone was thrashing around in the very last room in the house and we didn't know what the hell to do. Determined not to let this person scare us, we run towards the last room and confront this asshole, but when we get there, there's nothing and no one. The room was completely empty, but how and who? We were sure that it was coming from this room and there's no way whoever it was just slipped by us. I mean, the room had a sliding glass door leading into the backyard, but it was locked from the inside. And then, before we can gather our thoughts and ask each other what the hell was happening, there's more banging, and this time, from the kitchen. Scared out of my mind, we both agree that it's just time to leave. We make our way through the back door in the room and finally to the street, all while checking over our shoulders to ensure that no one was going to come running out of the house after us. And no one came and the neighborhood was quiet. 
Eric and I just start our walk home, talking about the house, when Eric notices that his pocket knife is missing. He then turns his pocket inside out to show me that he isn't joking too. We stop and he keeps telling me that we have to go back for it since it's his favourite one. Frustrated, I ask him, how did you lose it? It's your favourite knife. He assures me though that he never removed it from his pocket and has no idea how it could have been just removed like that. In the end, I agree to go with him and find it and we make it halfway up the street when Eric it tells me that his back feels like it's on fire. I can see that it's really bothering him too because of the expression of pain on his face. He asks me to lift his shirt and look at what could be causing the burning sensation. And I lift his shirt and quickly notice three really large scratches just starting from his right shoulder blade, going all the way down to his left hip, and then from his left hip across to his right hip. I tell him this and he immediately says that he thinks the house is haunted but he still wants to go and get his knife. I'm scared but I'm not going to let him go alone so we make our way back into the house and immediately hear that banging noise again but we made a pact with each other that we would not run no matter what happened. We begin our search for the knife looking high and low all the while hearing banging and now things are being thrown across the room. Of course, I'm scared shitless and I want to leave, but we haven't found the knife yet. We do one pass through the entire house and we end up in the kitchen. In the kitchen, there's an entrance to the second living room that you can see from the backyard. And in that room, there's one piece of furniture, a hutch. Now, we had already checked this room since it's near our point of entrance and we found nothing. But we decide one more pass through the room wouldn't hurt. I make my way into the dark room and let my light lead me to the hutch. And there it is. On the hutch, we found the knife. But we for sure checked this room and the hutch before. Either way, he didn't hesitate for a moment and he grabbed the knife and we just hightailed it out through the garage and back onto the street. But this is far from the end of the story. So, we make our way to our homes, but the entire week, we couldn't stop talking about the house and what was going on in there. We kind of brushed it off and didn't believe that there was not some sort of explanation, so we actually ended up going back. But this time, we bring three friends with us because they wanted to see this haunted house. While walking through the backyard, I can't explain it, but... For some reason, I wanted to get a closer look at the back of the house. I start making my way towards the house, but I start to feel really scared. A feeling of dread that just came out of nowhere. I turn away from the house and start my way back up to the group, but out of the corner of my eye, I saw something leap from the bushes. Some sort of dark figure leap from the bushes and into the tall grass that I mentioned earlier. But... When I gave it my full attention, it was just gone. I stared at the bushes for a moment, a, a little confused, but kind of brushed it off. I did mention it to the group when I caught up with them too, but it was quickly dismissed as just some sort of animal or something. We entered through the garage door, and this time we noticed a white bookshelf full of light bulbs in the garage. But the bookshelf was probably about five feet high and three feet wide and completely filled with packaged light bulbs. We study it for a moment and make our way into the kitchen with Merrick leading and me in the back. I enter last and shut the kitchen and garage door behind me. As soon as I release the doorknob though, we hear what sounded like someone in the garage breaking all the light bulbs on the bookshelf. Stunned, I remember my heart beating a mile a minute, waiting for whatever the hell it was to just start trying to fight its way into the kitchen. But nothing came and Eric finally said, I guess we're not going back now. We make our way to the very last room in the house, the same room that Eric and I had exited through the last time that we were there. And whatever it was, it did not disappoint. Random objects were being thrown against the wall in front of. We could hear loud banging all throughout the dark house like... There were people fighting in the damn house. 
one of the friends decides that he's just had enough and opens the glass door to the backyard and the four of us start making our way through to the backyard too. I turn around to wait for Eric and he was not moving. He was just kind of caught in a daze, standing in front of a, an unhinged door that was propped against the wall for support. Eric was staring down the hallway as if waiting for something. I had to call his name three times before he realized that we were leaving. He stepped forward and before my eyes, it looked as though someone tried to throw the unhinged door on top of him. Eric jumped out of the way just in time and started towards me, scared out of his wits. The other three are already almost to the street, so we both just keep up the pace and catch up with them. As soon as we reached the street, one of the friends kept telling us just how messed up that house was. You could actually see the look of terror on his face too as he expressed his feelings about the place. He then mentions a, a burning feeling going up his calf. And sure enough, he's got those same damn scratches starting from his ankle and stopping midway through his calf. Just before we split up to go home, the three of them, they just swear off that place and that was pretty much the last time that those three friends spoke to us. But there's a little bit more to this story yet. We ended up going to the house a few more times after that, but nothing absolutely memorable happened. We heard the knocks and the bangs and whatnot, but it wasn't until we took Eric's, and I'll call him Derek for clarity and privacy, obviously, Eric's older brother, that it got really crazy. But by this time, we visited the house a few times and had become numb to the banging and throwing. We found it more amusing than anything, like, check this place out, it's haunted. But this time, though, it got way more aggressive. After touring the house and seeing Derek freak out, we decided to have a chat in the kitchen. I was standing in front of the window just leaning against the windowsill and Eric was to my right, leaning against the wall and Derek was standing across from me in front of the doorway that leads into the second living room that I mentioned earlier. We talk about how scary the house is and all that and Derek turned around to check out the living room behind him. I mentioned to him that that's the hutch that we found Eric's knife on after running the whole house searching for it. As he turns to face me though, Derek just fell into the room, almost like something pushed or dragged him from behind. I remember looking at his face and seeing a look of terror as he tried to grab on for dear life to the doorway, but the push or pull was too strong and he just fell on his ass and into the room, but immediately jumped up and ran over to me. He grabbed me by my shirt and started screaming at me, what the hell is your problem, why did you push me? I just kept telling him that... I didn't push him and Eric jumped between us and confirmed what I was saying. But Derek explains that someone or something had just pushed him in. After that one, we obviously wanted to leave, so we all agreed, but before we leave, Eric and I both told Derek to check his pockets to see if anything was missing. And, of course, his pocket knife is now missing too. But it's okay, right? I mean, we found the last one and we'll find this one too. We searched the whole house and nothing, which, mind you, was kind of expected. But now it's time to check the hutch again. The first pass, there was nothing. The second pass, nothing. The third, nothing. Okay, so now this knife is really gone. Derek wants one more pass through the house and we agree and we make it to the far room with no luck. We started making our way back to the kitchen with me leading and as I'm coming back to the kitchen, my cell phone light starts to reflect off something shining in front of the door that led into the front yard. It was... It was the knife, but it was jammed deep into the door. But there was just no way that the knife could have been jammed into the door like that without any of us hearing it. Either way, Derek takes his knife and we just get the hell out of there. I never went back to the house after that because whatever was happening seemed to be escalating. And out of all the bullshit that went down in that house, that was the not welcome sign that I took seriously. And that's pretty much it. 
That's everything that I can remember. Eric actually moved not too long after that, and I moved away at the end of 2009, and I haven't seen the house since. Well, except when I tell the story to friends, and I'll pull up the house on Google Images or something. I do visit Eric from time to time still, and we always talk about what happened there. 